Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Comic Book Chronicles. After the holiday break. Indeed. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And I hope everyone had a great and happy holiday. If you um, observed the Turkey Day, hopefully you're full and stress-free. <laughs> after all of that and if you did not um celebrate hope you had a good time off or whatever however you celebrate so uh but we are back and uh i am your host for tonight roddy cat you can find me at roddy cat on twitter you can also find me at news News need on twitter you can also find me at new uh well news News need reddit and you can also find me at uh cb caps on instagram <laughs> And that smooth jazz voice that you just heard. Wait a second. Uh, you know what we didn't play? <laughs> he thought I forgot. I was just going to try to scroll, kind of crawl over that. Be to be <laughs> really honest. So, um, but apparently the, the fast fingers of one uh, smooth jazz voice, agent underscore 70 on Twitter and Instagram. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, forgive me. My throat is a little bit under the weather, so I'm definitely coming at you guys with the morning voice. So, so you know, not... <laughs> oh, sorry. Not, uh, no, 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 you good. Do not adjust your your internets because that is exactly how he's going to sound tonight. Exactly, I'm going to sound like this the entire night. So, so, and I know a couple of people who already like his voice is probably going to be like, "Ooh." <laughs> so yes, your cards and letters. I'm sure you can ring out your panties. Oh, um, yeah, there you go. Throw your panties <laughs> on the stage. I'm kidding. That's that's. that's <laughs> I guarantee you, there's probably at least one or two people to that. That's high um maybe i don't know <laughs> but anyway hey you know th this this is what it is folks we are back after the uh, thanks for all Lord. not with us um unfortunately but you know hey they got things to do i think i hope um born pcn underscore dirt on twitter pop culture net on twitter pop culture network.com and his umbrella sites there in <laughs> and the osiris of this ish huh I'm sorry, I just looked at your notes for a second. That's, um, anyway, one uh, TMDOGG98 on Twitter, the Click Nation on Twitter. That's the KLIQNATION and the Click uh, CB Cron, which is the 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 um the account, the Twitter account for this year's show. And of course, comic book resources was over there, right in this face off, burning the midnight oil. <laughs> So I'm sure because I think he was pretty much busting it down uh, during the holidays too, from what I was seeing. Uh, yeah, he had out over the last week, so mm -hmm. so good on that dude. We missed that dude. We missed both of those dudes. Let's face it. But, yes, yeah. but they do contribute, so they are. They do. They do. Uh, you know, let us know what they're reading. It's true, and we will hopefully get them back in uh, because we are vastly and fastly coming to the end of the year and therefore our end of the year show um which you we usually do after the beginning of the year right <laughs> should be forthcoming at that right. point it's just too hard to fit in with the holiday schedule so well yeah and it's probably better to do a year in show after the the year year ends right in a way in a lot of cases go figure that's it's just more like, it's more like a year in slash new year show yeah basically yeah actually yeah, we have actually had it on a weekend uh, on new year's uh once or twice so that's that's apt. But in the meantime, uh, we are here with not just one, but two weeks worth of books. Yes. Um, but don't worry, because we, we already took the liberty of kind of paring down our lists and checked them twice. Absolutely. So we will start with last week's books um, with actually we forgot to totally forgot the um, I think it was because we have so many books to talk about. Um, yeah, there's that, but we've totally uh, forgot to talk about what we're gonna start with. Sure, let's just <laughs> take a quick peek at Roddy Cat's books from last week. Um, we can start with um, you want to do the X books? Sure, yeah, let's do that. All right, all right, so uh, I guess we'll start with what X Force. We can start with X Force, that's fine. 
Yeah, that works. Um, right, because, so, oh, I don't know if you, you've continued to do, to do this, but I can do the same thing where I'm just starting to read them whenever, or not whenever, but out of the reading order. I have not been. Right. I have not been sticking to the reading order myself. Yeah, because I don't. I don't really think they've been. I think that's just stick on it. Right. I was about to say. I. I honestly think that's a release order, just to get, let people know that. I mean, it is basically. Yeah. I don't know that these books are coming out um, on a regular basis, and other than the announcement about uh, X Men uh, being slightly delayed, only slightly delayed, not Watchmen delayed. <laughs> you know. Oh so, yeah. We we'll have to mention that later on, right? So X, you know, so X Force number two is out this week, and we are following, uh, you know, in the direct aftermath of the events of the cliffhanger ending in X Force number one, mm -hmm. and it, I guess it's appropriate to spoil it now because we're an issue later. Yeah, it's been. But I'll ring the bell just because it'll get the the discussion rolling. Yeah. So here we go. Spoiler bell. If you have not yet read X Force number one in three, two, one. Oh, wow. They just left that man's body just sitting out there like that, huh? Right. I mean, this is the immediate aftermath. Like, you know, I know, but there was like, wait, come on. They, you know, they could have put him somewhere or something. It's just like, no, just everybody gathered. So we did not know Professor Xavier was, um, he got got, was the target of a, an assassination yeah. attempt on the island. That apparently went off without with with less of a hitch. So X Force number two, they are I guess this is Magneto kind of uh, one rallying the troops and taking to, taking over uh, one in one respect and getting and this is also every all of the investigation and therein after that starting up from the right. In the, right this is Cohen CSI basically. So, uh, as as Roddy Cat said, uh, you know, Magneto's rallying the troops at the beginning of the issue, but the bulk of the issue is um, is uh, um, focuses upon the investigation and what they're able to figure out and where what leads that they're going to follow. So and um, and bolstering the island in the in the um, in the in the wake of what happened. Right. So there are a couple of things that happen in this issue that help fill in some of the gaps. Uh, that came up during issue number one. Um, just I'm just going to go quickly off my notes. The X Force team still has not, at least from what we've seen on the covers, you know, is what is supposed to be the official team, still hasn't officially formed. Right. The members of the new squad are utilizing their strengths to investigate the assassination. Um, the issue also ends on a suspense, suspenseful cliffhanger, and the information page. Um, I guess it's the penultimate or the or the final information page fills us in on the nature of Domino's mission from issue one, and that fills in a lot of the question marks that I had. Yeah, and and things for someone as uh, whose powers is lucky, uh, being lucky, the Domino is not in a um, in a lucky situation, right? At, um, at this point, so yeah, that that whole situation was like, ooh. Man, that's kind of graphic. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and there was also the inclusion of a very unwarranted um, um, team up between Wolverine and Quentin Quire, whom, yes, if 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 you've stuck with the show for any length of time, you know I can't stand Quentin Quire. <laughs> He's got pink hair, you know. Well, not even just that. This is attitude, but yeah, oh, that too, that too, yeah. that too. Yeah, and 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 play and and it's. Pretty much bolstered up, like they've toned it down and like say wackos and and other places there's in them, but yeah, there's like uh, I think wait X Force. I'm trying to remember, um, this is a uh, who's right, uh, Tiny High right right in X Force. I can't remember. Uh, but basically the oh, it, uh, Benjamin Percy, uh, Percy, yes, 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 that's right. So basically, it's it's bulked up. It's it's it's. You know, it's his, amplified, right? His personality yeah. is definitely amplified in this book. So back to where it was back when we first met him, yeah, right. So it's which is annoying to say the least for me. Oh, and there's the spy, uh, Firestar sighting. I had to put that in my notes because we're like, oh, you know, really? Yeah, yeah. she was kidding. when Magneto was basically had everybody gathered around. She was up in the top right corner. No kidding. Corner. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, cool. So I look out for stuff like that. Oh, yeah, look at that. Mm -hmm. Cause it's like you know it's like all the mutants on the island and, and a lot of the folks we haven't seen yet, 
like they're just pepper jokers, you know, in places. Um, so I was like, okay, that's great to see you. Now put her in a book. Um, preferably with Iceman and Spider Man, but you know, right. that's, but that's just me. Um, hey, if they have enough hits on Disney Plus for that show, you never know. Yeah, and plus the the, the last say five or six years where there's been a couple of issues where they've teamed up again together. Um, right, that's just the Gen X, the Gen X creators finally getting into power and be like, hey, we're going to do this. Right. We grew uh, up with this, so. Basically, um, if you haven't read what was the uh, Iceman Volume One, Number Eleven, something like that, I can't remember what it was, but regardless, oh. of the, there was there was that last uh, team up with him it was great. Anywho, uh, yeah, X Force pretty much got down to the nitty gritty of, of the of the aftermath, and uh, I assume we're just going to keep going. This, this, this book is going to be the one that's going to keep going with that part, right? With the investigation and mm -hmm. and following up on what happened, because pretty much all the other books they either well. Last time most of these books came out, they were either about to reference or kind of was kind of around. Where in this week, you know, you you see not necessarily so much uh, kind of overlap, but you know, people are kind of just already doing their own thing in the other books as we will, as we will see, right? Even though they some of them stuff gets still gets referenced uh, right. in this week's books. Right. And some of them are still off world, which leads exactly, back to which gets referenced in this week's book. But yeah, mm -hmm. this this uh, leads into the next X book that I read, New Mutant uh, Number Two. That's right. Mm -hmm. I know you were, where you're going with that. Which, um, yeah, I I I have been enjoying New Mutant so far. You know, so this okay. So there's a couple of things about this this uh this issue I love. It's a particular click of the week for me because in. If you remember correctly, and I know you do, but if folks out there may not remember, Hickman wrote uh, the Avengers books a couple of years ago, which you know kind of has some similar similar flavorings to this, which we, we've already mentioned. He also put in, which I think we've already said before, uh, Cannonball, Sunspot, and um, Smasher, who's not a mutant but just who is now married to Cannonball. So then you know their whole friendship thing was that, and Bobby's you know speaking of um, personalities who are who's amped back up again uh this is pretty much you know full full on bobby and you never go full bobby yeah <laughs> because you know he can he can't be himself but i but i love, but I love some spot you know for weird reasons so yeah they're still out in space and bobby's you know and, and some spots doing this thing because he so and this brings up another thing because um Supposedly, I thought Bobby gave away all of his money at the end of that uh, AIM thing because he turned over AIM to uh, Tony Ho, and I thought he had given up all his money at that time. I'm fairly certain he did. He's like, nope, I ain't got it because he he almost said he didn't have any more money because basically all of those assets were, you know, he he gave them all away or did something with them or pushed them all into AIM, one of the two. And I can't remember what he did, but, but now apparently, you know, he still has... He still has some funds, and I guess as irresponsible as he is, he still has some sort of business sense. Right, X Corp is still alive, apparently. Exactly. Yeah, and that was other. This was, was like, wait, that's still going, and he still flew it with cash. I'm like, all right, well, sh sure. That's, you hey, know. if you can reset lives with with Krakoa, you know. Yeah, um, yeah no, yeah, he, he being one of the ones back from the dead. Exactly. So, um, you know, one of the things I love about this book is the artwork by Rod Rice. It's yeah. so clean. It is beautiful to look at. It tells, of it tells the story beautifully. Mm -hmm. You know, that is not, you cannot, you cannot uh, emphasize that enough. He actually has a good sense of storytelling as well as um, just, you know, great line work, great color work, because mm -hmm. my understanding is that he's doing all of that because he's listed as the artist. Right. So, um, so basically, he put in some time, right? I mean, he's you know more more likely than not, this is color, uh, this is colored by uh, computers, probably drawn in computer as well. So it makes it a very efficient process. But that all that aside, um, the story was fun and ends on a fun cliffhanger, indeed. So yeah, so the whole again, I mentioned the whole Hickman and Avengers thing, and you know Bobby and and, and Sam's uh, friendship during that, like that comes back out dur during this, and like like nothing's really ever changed, even though they've uh, according to this haven't seen each other for months, you know, 
Which, like, wait, does does Sam even know if Bobby died? But remember, Bobby and uh, Rain, Ronnie, whatever, because uh, they both. That was all pre. I know War of the realms. So I know, but like, during War of the Realms, right? Pre and during War of the Realms, and right. ten, they were not in communication at that time. So he probably doesn't know. Yeah. So I'm, I'm so stuff like that kind of, like, you know, like, I wonder if that's even going to come up. But that's like sad. So that it, that doesn't matter as much. It's just like, huh, interesting. Right. So you know, um, right. So this issue, I was about to say, this issue has the band, the old school New Mutants, getting back together again. Yep. And uh, minus one. You know, straight up, yeah, exactly. In, in spirit, well, he's there in a way, but. right? Exactly, exactly. He is there as part of Doug Ramsey. Um, what I was gonna just add is it's the uh, the original band plus Chamber and Mondo. Exactly. Ooh, I love I love the picture that Rod Rice put in there of the OG New Mutants all getting together for a group hug. Yeah, I love that. Mondo and Chamber are off to the side, like, yeah, we're over here, guys. It was just like, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was so well done. Yeah, like that whole thing with them getting back together and, and just talking talking to each other and you know, like the the whole um Sam and Sam and Bobby thing, you know, when they were off talking. Uh Smasher. <laughs> Smasher yeah. has always been a, a an interesting character when from when she came through. Cause I was like, you know what? And, and I said in my notes, for someone who's like from Iowa, she sure takes her space job very seriously. Right. So and and that apparently has which was slightly different from well, she was just coming into it when when Hickman was doing, you know, uh, Avengers. But you know, but since then, every time you've seen her, she's been kind of the the um, the straight lace on the nose one. Sure. So, but in that whole thing, including her um, her little dialogue with uh, Iana, was was kind of funny for what it was. But yeah, so they're still out in uh, out in space, and they got themselves in a little trouble as to, as they tend to do, and now they are. Um, at the service of the Shi'ar Empire. Sure. And of course, which actually I totally forgot about. So, um, you know, Gladiator has been in, in charge and now I guess he was like, look, I got to turn this over just to kind of give a little bit of whatever it's like. I got to give this over to the person who's actually, um, you know, should be in charge, but they're not ready yet. To the person, in, um, Xandra, who we saw, if you've read uh, Rogue and Gambit's book before they got married, or actually... No, it was after, after we got married. Excuse me. Sorry. I was about to say, I did not read that. So I didn't know where that came from, where there was another Niramani who was ready to take the throne. So, yeah, uh, that's where she, well, at least for, for, that's pretty much where she came into play. Okay. Um, because just, just as a, just as a little bit of, of, um, fill in information for, uh, lady, the ladies and gentlemen out there listening, um, Kalark, otherwise known as, uh, Gladiator, the Praetor of the uh, Shi'ar Imperial Guard. Has been uh, basically the head of the Shi'ar Empire for a while now. Um, uh, you know, not at you know, and it's not re and it's not to his liking, but he has to do it because he is, you know, the uh, the, the most um, powerful member of the Imperial Guard. So he for, for being a confidence based um, powered uh, uh, foe, yeah, he he. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, when he's confident, he can bring it. You know, we can definitely stand. You know, he can stand toe to toe with the best of them. Mm -hmm. So, but 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 with you know, but but what I was getting at is he's not comfortable being a politician, which he, is weird because you know the way he was running. Like, I get why he wanted to get away because like he's basically saying like, look, this is not a job for me. This is you know, I'm I'm supposed to be at the head of the Imperial Guard, not doing right. this. And it kind of shows in certain ways by the way he handles himself, and he knows that he's a, he's aware of that, right. Which right. this is a level of self awareness that I was kind of surprised to see from him. Right. What I was going to say is this is a long running storyline with him. Anywhere he appears, it sort of comes up as you know, like the reluctant leader of the Shi'ar um, Empire. So uh, to see that, you know, this was you know, I'm glad that you filled that in that uh, that there is a, a branch of the Niramani, um, uh a family tree that is ready to to, or at least at some point, right, will some point will be ready to uh, take over the throne. Yes, but uh, until then, they had to bring in someone else who is who is uh, who's of that line. And of course, you know, if you know anything about the Shi'ar um, hierarchy or, or or royal family, you know there was some. Um, there is a a person who is usually red -headed, yeah, not quite the redheaded stepchild, but yeah, yes, basically someone who is usually um, 
I almost in a Loki like fashion uh, nearest the throne, <laughs> let's just say. But um, okay, so that's funny. Yeah. So, but so there, so there is that in play. So, um, and and of course, you know, again, uh, Bobby being Bobby, when they find out their mission and get to the get to um, get into uh, meeting with said person, which I guess we probably won't spoil at this point, but you kind of already. Right. You can kind of figure it out if you are knowledgeable about this corner of the universe. Right. So you know who's always going to come back into play. And then sure enough, she does. So yeah. there is that. And I'm like, okay, well, this is good. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more of how this, this plays out. Mm -hmm. um, well, that was it for last week. I can't remember. Yeah. But I'm speaking not, of Gladiator, speaking of Gladiator, we actually see him in a non X book this week. And that is eventually. Not this week, but this week of books. Right. Right. This week's worth of books. Uh, or, or just to make it accurate, in last week's run of books, we also saw Gladiator in Avengers number 27. This is true. Um, which, yeah, that's... See, if, I've told you, said this to people before, usually my, my reading order kind of goes off. It's like, well, if this gets something gets picked up from one book and... Had just happened to come into another in some kind of way. That's usually how it runs, and it's just so happened that Avengers happened to be the case, because we see Gladiator kind of out there um, investigating something that happened uh, in a sector of space of his, and he's basically like, "Hey, look, if y'all are here for me, I want you to call, <laughs> get in contact with these people," which also, which is kind of surprising actually, because usually, you know, like the Shi'ar and the Kree are usually pretty, um, are are pretty uh, oh, yeah, you know, right, and you don't expect them to ask for help, right? You don't expect them to call the earthlings for help, exactly. That's, and that's exactly what happens in this issue because what Gladiator does is exactly what Roddy Cat just mentioned, which is when you know, if I don't if I don't check in by X date and X time, then you need to call up the earthlings and right. the earthlings think come, you know, hurtling through space to help out. Right, but in, I, I, I'm believing it is this specific reason as to why. Other, other than that, they would have been like, "No, nah, we can handle this ourselves." Probably until you know, until we couldn't. So I'm, I suspect we will probably find out if that is the case or not. But we, we jump from that being the case, him jumping on what? There's a lot of jumps, or well, there's a couple of different jumps in in this uh, issue because we jump from that to the Avengers getting to after get, Avengers getting the call and them getting prepped for the space, and then right. we jump into the future a bit. To yeah. the mission going foobar, yeah, oh, it went totally bad. Oh, but before that, you know, we go to the mission where they're getting, where they're basically getting ready to go, and of course, you have a space mission. So, who else would you call but Black Widow? Of course, that makes total sense because, as I have in my notes, what Mockingbird wasn't uh, wasn't available because ultimately, you know, and and I kind of like uh, what Aaron did in some of the dialogue. There is, hey, you know, I don't really belong here, but you know, we're sure, you know, the the reasoning is that they're shorthanded and Panther's not going into space either. So because he's looking for Tony, who is right. um, who they didn't mention, but is lost in the past. Because well, you know, that, they don't know that, they're exactly what I was going to say. Is they, yeah, don't they don't know that, that but yeah. they do mention that's what he's doing is that he's looking right. for Tony. So exactly. So which again, if you can't have too many, you can't go too far in a an adventure story without have some kind of time travel. Um, component going on, so at least yeah. nowadays, exactly. Well, just in general, because I mean, hell, you know, the, the wackos had a couple of them, and even in the past, uh, Avengers runs, so I was like, Yeah, there's been a few different times that the Avengers had the had right. some time shenanigans going on, right? So, so I just wanted to, to, to mention, you know, just a couple things I jotted down in my notes that I'm not sure if this is the first time the Avengers have dealt with the brood. But uh, you know, it, it's it's funny to see the Sleezoids abound. And you know, see the Avengers fight the prisoners of a Shi'ar prison, mm -hmm. and um, the latest happenings in Silver Surfer Black seem to have caught up to the Avengers book. <laughs> yes, apparently. So, which we knew was going to happen because, well, we I think we even said that at some point around Annihilation that was going to things were going to kind of come back into fold. We didn't think it was going to be this soon, but right. apparently, yeah, uh, uh, Surfers. Hey, uh, well, he's not silver anymore, but the surface shows up at the end of this after things have already gone bad. Um, well, I was about to say they're gone from bad to worse in this sense because 
we're not sure what role he is going to play. Right. Doesn't look like it's a good one. Um, right. Uh, we also find out that apparently, um, um, well, one, uh, Captain Marvel's gone binary again because of being out in space and being close to a, a white star. She also stole a star jammer ship because that was apparently abandoned, even though we do know they are around. Right. It, it, it's kind of funny because in the New Mutants, it's a similar looking ship, but it's not the exact same ship. Exactly. But obviously, that is left to the artist's imagination, so it's hard to know. But, you know, Aaron gives us a reason behind it. It's just right. the original or an older version of it. Right. It was just sitting out there parked by a star, you know, no big, no biggie. So my, it's probably, I, I, I would say it's probably in a, in a, in a, whatchamacallit, in a, a spare hideout or something. It's like, hey, you know, they left one here for me to, you know, for, for anyone to use. So maybe, yeah, maybe. But yeah, that, that wasn't specifically said, but yeah, maybe. But my, like I said, my, my was thinking was like, uh, no, no, that was their ship that, that was the same ship from New Mutants that they went off and because they went off and done something else and just left it there and she just took it. Yeah, that would be funny. Would have been funny. Like then they come back and like, where is our ship? See Avengers twenty seven. Yeah, right. <laughs> that would be some serious continuity right there. I know, right? Which you know, that would be. Saying. I hate to say this, and you know, uh, we'll move on to the next book after this, unless you have something else to add. Um, yeah. I was just going to add that uh, back in the day, you know. 70s 80s marvel when everything was operating out of the marvel bullpen offices in new york like everything was operating all the editors and stuff that was a lot easier to do right you know where or where like the creators were all basically in the same area so mm -hmm. you know it was a lot easier to coordinate um even though everyone is available electronically now i still don't right. think it's i still don't think it's the same so i mean i i would Given some books, especially this week, you would think, but I don't know. I, I feel like they they have may have tightened it up to where somebody's keeping track of all of that, and therefore they have like, if not the editors, there's some some group in there that's like, well, I mean, they've said this before. It's like, yeah, you can use this 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 and this for this reason because they're being used elsewhere and that kind of thing. They've said that stuff, stuff but I feel like somebody's keeping track of all that. On this, there's some spreadsheet in 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 the New York office, but like, ah. Uh, Oh, this right. is what we got going on with this that so because right. that that has to be able to explain uh, a couple of characters that we're going to talk about from the current week's books sure being around everywhere and, and there's mother although even part of that still doesn't really right. um, say much but anyway but until we get to that point do you want to uh, fire the rest of these books um or do you have one more do you want to do let me see what else i got um yeah sure we could do that all right so i'm going to spin it up we're just going to do uh, the week of oh, oh just uh, the previous week, the week of Thanksgiving's book. So I'm gonna spin up the the uh, mini gun real quick, and we're gonna get rolling on that. All right, um, I'm gonna talk about a book that. What's that? <laughs> Look at eight to seven trying to keep the show tight. Yeah, because we know because we have two sets of. Uh, oh, I know, I know. I'm so. Yeah. What we have, what, what I'm going to do is talk about a book that I I don't think you read. It's an image book called Philadelphia. That's what I was looking at earlier when when I was when I when that struck me. So yeah, what's the deal? Right. So this book is by um, the writer is a TV writer, and the the writer is a TV writer. I'm just I just want to look up um, uh, the names of the creators. It's Rodney Barnes, and the artist is Jason Sean Alexander. Oh, I was wondering why his name was coming up recently. Okay, right. Yeah. And it's a story about a cop following through on his cop father's investigation. And he discovers that, 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 where is it? <laughs> Vampires in Philadelphia, including one very close to home and one rooted in American history. So it's pretty interesting. And the art is definitely well done it's an entertaining and very pretty looking book so i would definitely uh take a look at issue number two could be uh, vampires in brooklyn yeah I, you know i i almost made a joke about that in my notes as soon as i saw vampires in philadelphia on my notes i was like well it could be vampires in brooklyn mm -hmm. um the next book i wanted to talk about is jane foster valkyrie number five did you have this i did mm -hmm. okay so um, there was a great Goodwill Hunting reference in a great action-packed issue. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of got a kick out of that when I saw how it was pulled off because I didn't expect it. 
I did not expect it when I was scrolling through, and it was you know the 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 uh, the setup is the same, but because of who speaks it, it's different. And if you know what I'm talking about, it involves apples. Um, <laughs> there's yeah. also a cool twist on the idea of uh, Valhalla in this issue. I really like this. It's a really a lot of fun. Yeah, and there was there was the 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 bits with the horse, especially a, a, an atomic steed that happens to show up. Uh, oh yes, that, that that I was like, host. Oh, now they see this is the thing about I'm loving about, and I don't know if this is, this is, was intentional because because they've been doing this great in the last couple of years. Like they've just been popping up stuff, uh, just left and right. And I'm like, hey, remember this? Well, remember continu- this? right, they're weaving yeah. continuity into the into the stories. Like oh, yeah. or just either references to something, or or you know they'll you know some prop or something that happened to come out like right it's a little bit more than an easter egg you know it's not just in the background they're actually using it right so this just kind of reminded me, hey this is the thing we had remember and it's like um for people like me and 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 age of seven it's like okay yeah and and that still goes to this this is current week's book stuff so we'll, which we'll get to right anyway but yeah that's a great issue right and and uh i haven't looked at the sales numbers but uh if this book needs support and i suspect that it does Go out and support it. It is so well done. We want to see more of uh, Jane Foster Valkyrie on the stands. And someone shows up, which I won't mention. Uh, you know who's been showing up lately that we'll get to for in the current week's books. Sure. Uh, next up is Black Panther number eighteen. Mm-hmm. I think Roddy Cat read this as well. Of course. Um, T'Challa and Aurora discuss the events. Basically, discuss the events of the first seventeen or so issues of this book um, that happened both in space and in the past. And they kind of resolve upon a course of action. So actually, if you're looking for a place to jump on, jump on now. Actually, it goes a little further than that because they specifically talk about right after he goes into the wormhole, uh, what happens after he gets, you know, quote unquote, lost. Right. Like the, the what? So which I thought partially was unnecessary, but I get why they did it because it was like okay, that clearly he had to talk out some stuff, and it was kind of going somewhere that i'm assuming is going to bear out you know in, in right. some some issues coming going forward but it was like did the, like there was like part of that didn't really necessarily need to be it was mm-hmm. a talking heads issue and yeah. it was a lot of exposition you know, like i said explaining a lot of what happened over the past 17 issues so if you were looking to maybe jump on and maybe um weren't so enthusiastic kind of like i was with um the pacing of the previous issues this served as a good primer and you know maybe even as an impetus to go back and review it i kind of wonder about that I've, yeah i've thought about that because i get why you're saying that and yeah as we've been reading it for, for the way we have you know and now that it's all digested um yeah it just kind of gives a little bit more to it but at the same time i don't know the, it was paced the way it was for a reason and and reading this and then going back and reading that We'll definitely give it a little more context, but it also might mess up some things. I don't know in the in the way he told it. I don't know, right? But it'll definitely fill in any gaps that you felt might exist. Um, you know, in terms of uh, how did you know uh, maybe uh, leaps of logic or maybe you can give away too much to where it would be unnecessary to finish reading that if you read this and then go back to it. Right. But my main point still stands, which is if you're looking to jump on, this is a good place <laughs> to do it. I'm not sure about that, but yeah. Well, I think so, simply because it summarizes and gives you a reason for the next arc, you know? Oh, that part is true, yes. Right. So, but, um, right. so that's it for me for last week. Okay. Um, Fallen Angel is number two. Did you read it? I skimmed it. Go ahead. Um, so, luckily, this is fairly fresh. So, basically, the team basically, um, or the what is the core, I guess, of the team is coming together um, on whatever this mission cycle is, is getting them on, and they all have a lot to supposedly get out of it, I, I suppose. This is... A, um, so the book... This is a shout-out to Brian Hill, who's writing this book, um, you know, who's been on the show before. <clears throat> um, and again, we have another... Um, you know, a mutant that shows up. That's what shows up in this one. Because we hadn't seen her in a minute, and she's also ro- weirdly she's rocking um like late eighties like late eighties Dazzler look, 
with you know with the jacket and the the blue the blue thing. But anyway, that's you know right. like, that's a weird choice, especially given what's you know been going on with her the last few years. But regardless, um, like I said, the Psylocke and X23 and and the whole crew they kind of. I guess they they're pretty much getting themselves together on for what mission this is, and there's a couple of different missions that they got to go on, though, which are linked together. But they have motivations within themselves to for their different things and different things they need to get out of it. Um, she did Black Panther, Ironheart number twelve would be my last one from that book. I am sad to say that this is the last issue of this book, which we. I think we kind of knew uh, coming for for a minute now, but at least it got twelve, I guess. But I really, really enjoyed this book, and um, All right, it got the full trade paperback or two trade two, two smaller trade paperbacks. Yeah. Yes, and they they finished it up on a nice, neat note. But there's some more stuff there that could have been, you know, could have gone a little bit longer. But you know, I, again, we don't know what the sales are, whether this was intentional. I, I don't think it was. But bear in mind, we also know that uh, they're going to relaunch Ironheart as part of Iron Man 2020. There is that, and also um, they they mentioned at the end of this that you know the incoming uh, event that's going to happen sometime this month. She's going to be a part of that with the champions. So it is not the end of Ironheart, just the end of the series. This this particular volume of the series, I should say. Right. You know, um, like I said, I enjoyed it. And shout out to um to to E Viewing, who who did a bank up job on this uh, on this book. You know, we get we basically get a little bit more backstory into uh, Ruby's dad, and come to find out that there are things that are not what it seems with his backstory, and may possibly go some way into clinging curler, uh, not necessarily retconning, but kind of. Slightly cleaning up a little bit of Riri's. It doesn't change anything that's already happened, but just kind of, you know, gives a little bit more color to it, I guess, sort of. But like I said, it ends on a nice, neat note. So, but I hated that it ended. Uh, that is it for me. Okay, I got Last a bunch week. of books. Yeah, at least, or at least for that point. Like I got a few, bunch more books that I read, but we're just gonna keep it. Oh, actually, I do want to bring up one. Um, because Invisible Woman number five. Is it in the spillover? Huh. Oh, Did I didn't put it down. Oh, no. you didn't put it down? Okay. Like I said, like, yeah, I told you I had like other notes that I didn't put on the sheet. But I got you. I got you. So, um, Invisible Woman number five also ended with uh, issue number five. And it was, I don't know. It, it was all right. I, I enjoyed it for what it was. And I feel like the ending of it, it's either it either ended the way I expected or it didn't end the way I expected. And I kind of expected more out of it. I don't know. I'm in the same boat. <laughs> I definitely understand where you're coming from simply because given how this story played out with the former uh, spy partner, you kind of knew what would happen to the former spy partner, but how it was executed left, I think, a little bit to be desired. Yes. And I didn't quite agree with how Sue Richards uh, reacted to the whole thing. Yeah. But... Um, it did feel very human, which was, you know, which, which I think is the whole point because most of the super spies don't possess, you know, powers on Sue Storm's level. Right. Or and, her moral compass. Right. And, you know, with that, you know, and, and with, you know, without those, you know, these spies have to do things uh, just to survive a, a, a certain way. And, you know, just to see her have to, you know, kind of cope with, um, you know, that 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 reality you know because that's essentially the that was essentially the uh the, the at least part of the moral conflict right so that's pretty much it there was a couple other books about that but that's none um i don't know did you Joy, you said you didn't read any of the nine nine stuff did you no no we'll it's spidey it's spidey okay yeah with them we'll talk about that later because those books are i'm not sure what to say about even those books right whether or not catch up on them is another story yeah, I don't. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of where it's looking. So we'll, we'll go ahead and get into the, this week's books. Uh, starting with, I know we both read and both liked. I'm fr- I'm almost fairly. You know what? Since you mentioned it, Amazing Spider-Man number thirty-five. Actually, uh, that wasn't where I was going to go, but might as well. Sure. So, Doctor Doom demands justice. Yes, and 
as we've mentioned uh, over the past several um, shows, I think, um, dealing with this storyline, we're trying to figure out what on earth uh, they're getting at here with Doom kind of triggering this 29 to 9 event. And not only that, but do you think his response, like I get it, it's in service to the story, but his response was even for Doom was just, especially having been publicly exposed in the FF not that long ago, like on a global scale, for him to react this way to this, like I had me feeling like basically Peter was in the beginning of the book. Like, I don't, you know, sure. And I'm like, that was, it was even for, even for Doom, that was a little over the top for this. Right. Like it wasn't like it was him. It was his, it was his Doombot that got that, that got shot. Which you know, chalk that up because one Doom shows up again this you know uh, here in another book from this week because um, he's kind of one boy and has been making rounds, including I don't think I think he's yeah even in the twenty nine books, but that's all centered around this. Um, I don't know. It was just weird. But at the same time, we see, you know, Peter teaming up with his sister again, and they're going after the uh, chameleon who they have to get them to the hill. And that apparently that device that um, Peter's classmate um, was working on comes into play and I guess is part of the catalyst of more of the 2099 stuff. So I don't know. This one's a weird because this feels real loosely to like you kind of it's kind of like what you're just saying. It's like this feels kind of or I assume what you're saying is you know that whole 2099 stuff and this don't feel that connected. Well, really what what I was getting at is at some point this is the impetus for all of it. Right. And we still haven't seen how. Right. But this I think is the how. And we're going to find out in the next issue what events you know have contributed since what supposedly happens on the cliffhanger page in this issue how that affects the 2099 event going forward right which so, feels, which still kind of feels a little a little loose and lacking because right. yeah. it's it, it, listen this is not this has not been the the the, the best lead into an event um in the spidey books for a while so right because because at this point there are at the very least what three well that's probably four at this point because special would just have to come out like at least four twenty nine nine books out mm-hmm. and yes there are in the world of twenty ninety nine which there was their whole point and you know dealing with people who have and have not you know been in that world especially one new person uh Conan who that book was interesting um but but none of it really kind of calls back into or directly into this with the exception of doom being involved and, you know, loose references to him. Right. And, and, you know, that world. So, I don't know. Weird. How uh, about, I was about to say, are we done with that? Yeah. I was going to go to Dr. Doom since he was. Okay. Was no, I, I didn't. Okay. So yeah. Cause I basically wanted to do that, even though it has nothing to do with that, but it's basically one, another doom sighting. But, and speaking of sightings, this is also, uh, Doom and Mephisto, uh, because after the events of last issue, Doom, hey, guess what? Doom gets shot, actually gets shot, and he goes to hell. Spoiler. And he meets up with Mephisto, who he just disrespects. <laughs> he even duffs him one good time, or a couple good times. Like, Doom's like, look, I don't, I don't, I don't have to be here. Screw you. Bip. It, it's, 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 it's all kind of amusing. So, both Doom and Mephisto have been in a lot of places lately, uh, which is why I bring that up. And Mephisto, so I feel like their meeting was uh, bound to happen at some point, I, I suppose. Uh, and I guess this was it. I don't know whether I, I assume that was intentional or whatnot, or this is still leading up to something bigger. I don't know why I'm, I keep thinking there might be, mm-hmm. but I doubt it. Cause I mean, we know for, we feel like Mephisto has been in enough places where something's going to, there's got to be something coming out of that, but at the same time, these two meeting each other. Not to saying they don't have past history because they do, right? Um, and that they and that gets played out here, and so some real. I don't want to call it, for lack of a better term, cringy. Uh, a thing happens that has nothing to do with what I'm thinking of. But if you th- if you knew where my thought pattern was and what Doom says or yells out in relation to someone else that uh, of his past and giving past history, it's like say secret wars. That's right. like, well, icky. 
Uh, but anyway, um, yeah. So Doom basically battles battles. Not even it's not even a battle to be honest. The like, Doom goes to hell, messes with Mephisto, comes back to Earth, and then, um, actually, then not really much happens because he's back. Wakes up, and if you know the rapper MF Doom, he he wakes up in clothes that looks like something the MF Doom was wear. Okay. Which is kind of funny, and which is which is why I have a reference to to that in in my notes. Um, and now he's basically getting caught up on, you know, thanks to Gang Kang getting caught up on, you know, who did it, who did it to him. So I guess this is where he's going to go from there and and figure that out. It's like it's even in this, the stuff that happens, in, you know, and uh, Spider Man, you know. He goes less ballistic on, like he's kind of calm about, it, except well, except for his one little outburst when he woke, quote unquote, woke back up from being dead. You know, um, you know, it, it was still had a more meter than you know the whole twenty nine and nine stuff, which is weird. So, but anyway, that's Doctor Doom number three. That's you know, like I said, whether that Mephisto and or Doom stuff is going to go into any place meaningful, we'll see at some point. Right. Um, how about we jump to the distinguished competition for a book that actually three of us read? Justice uh, number thirty-seven. Mm -hmm. I skimmed it. Right. So I know that Roddy Cat skimmed it. PCN underscore Dirt actually read it and contributed some notes, and I read it. And it's so funny to see. I did not read Dirt's notes before I typed mine, and it's funny to see that we all mentioned the same thing, which is. Um, <laughs> yeah. the, league, the league gets in a circle yeah they have a prayer circle because they have it's no other options <laughs> to connect with the world yes. the way PCN underscore dirt put it was um, he appreciates the over the top bravado of the story but there are so many parts of it that just don't make sense the Justice League has to have faith in justice that's what we're talking about what does mm -hmm. that even mean <laughs> um uh, I mean, in in the in the in the in the course of the story, I mean, or in relation to the story, I get it. But at the same time, what really? Right. So there is a scene in this, and it makes me laugh. And I'm a huge fan of uh, the uh, the 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 JLA Avengers crossover. Hmm. And for anyone who picked up the JLA Avengers crossover, written by Kurt Busiek and drawn by the uh, legendary George Perez. Um, the book had the Justice League and the Avengers all yell out one of the best uh, superhero battle cries of all. Of course, Avengers assemble. Why? Because the Justice League doesn't have a battle cry at all. The best yeah. they got, the best they got is for what, justice. Yeah, League for justice. I'm like seriously, yeah. they can't even have. They don't even have the the the, the guts. To put it in big bold letters on the page because they're just embarrassed by it. I mean, well, think about it. You think you really think Batman would actually sell something like that? Would be able to? And God, I'm using a wrestling term. Oh Jesus, you know, right? He like, wouldn't be able to get over, right? Exactly. Yeah. Like he's not going to be able to sell that. Like this is Batman. Right. Like if right. it was they Superman, get, maybe right. they can't get Superman to yell that out for right. justice. Exactly. It's like it would be oh. more believable from him. But yeah, that part was actually kind of funny to me. And and as a uh, as Dirt, it's, it's also, this little, it's this little bubble, you know. Mm -hmm. It's this tiny yeah. little bubble. Yeah, so, it's almost like he just spoke it plain Jane. Like, like, yeah, he was supposed to be coming out of a loudspeaker or something. We don't know. Right. But, all right. Yeah, he was just like, yeah, for justice. I'm like, yeah, okay. All right. right. So, so yeah. but yeah, the whole uh, but like I was saying, uh, the, the like PC and under dirt. Um, that the whole uh, the so stupid scene was fun. But yeah, that was a good scene. I like yeah. that. That was that was pretty fun. But yeah, I was like, okay, this is, I get it. In relation to the story, I get why the whole prayer circle thing or the, the circle of justice, whatever you want to call that thing happened, but it's still kind of nonsensical. <laughs> right, right, right. So this is the penultimate issue. The next issue is actually, uh, I think Snyder ends on 39. Mm, so it's probably think... the epilogue. Right. Uh, so that'll be the epilogue issue. Next issue is the big showdown. We hope because it's been kind of running for a minute. Yeah, this has been going on for a while. You know, lots of uh, Perpetua and the Monitor, the Anti Monitor, and blah 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 blah. So yeah, I feel yeah. like a, a nowhere tug of war. Pretty much, pretty much. You know, they really made 
you know, they really stressed, you know, a newer character, uh, a newer feature character that they brought in, which is the child between uh, Shayera and uh, John Jones. So, Kendra. what? What's oh, Kendra? Kendra I'm yeah, it's not Shayera, but yeah, I was about to say Hawk Girl. Yeah, either way, yes, exactly. Right. Hawk Girl, but Hawk Girl, whichever Hawk Girl. Even their actual it was basically like a, I guess a future or an alternate, on alternate. Uh, universe version. I'm not, that that part even still because it's not like them in this universe. It's them from another uh, right. version of them, right? A version of them's, which I suspected something was going to happen with that child, and I don't. Uh, again, I didn't. I don't think I finished reading the book to know if that happened in this issue. Something's probably going to end up happening in that book because they're not going to keep that child out there for too much longer. I suspect, right. It's felt like they're just setting him up to just use him for something. But regardless, yeah, that's that's just like some 37, though. <laughs> All right. Next up, what do you got? Uh I have um well, let's do black cat. All right. Because after that, I pretty much got a slate of X books and some other stuff. Sure. Um we are both fans of the, the black cat. Uh, I can safely say that uh, between 8 to 7 and not myself. Yes. S and this issue, I feel, is no different. Like, it's, it's not heist-driven like the majority of the rest of them have been. Granted, it's only been seven issues. But yeah, this is a really... lot of exposition and, and, and uh, fill-in story. There is, but I, I, it's there is a good effect using this because if you could almost see this being played out cinematically. So on one hand, you see... Uh, the black cat kind of um, come to find Black Fox, who's been kidnapped, right. who is in the clutches of Odessa Drake, the head of the New York Guild. And on the other hand, you see Odessa Drake monologuing heavily to Black Fox, mm -hmm. uh, and we get her motivations behind the you know the things she's doing. And even Black Fox kind of gets under under her skin as to that said reason, or at least his what his reason is, which apparently. It seems to be on on the money, uh, and then the meeting of both of those two sides come together, and yeah, the, the book pretty much ending the way it does, not with a fight, but with a bunch of idle threats. And not even, maybe not even idle threats, but just a bunch of threats that are probably playing. Right, out. it's set up exactly. It's a setup for the big uh, showdown. Uh, the one thing I would add is that uh, during the monologuing and exposition, uh, what uh, Jed McKay did was weave in, actually weave in. Yes. You know, before we had teased about or we had discussed what they were getting at and some of the smaller things that they had mentioned, Easter eggs, really, that they had dropped about the other thieves' guilds and the whole system of thieves' guilds in the Marvel universe. In this issue, we actually got it in yes. set in 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 comic book stone, which is you know, weaving in the thieves' guild continuity from all the other books, including the X books, you know, as we've constantly referenced before in yeah, the picture, we can get a bow drop. Exactly. I was about to mention that. Yeah. So like it, yeah, with a nice little neat little bow, we get the whole little history, you know, the history of the, of the guild. Right. And we get, and we specifically get the backstory on the New York thieves guild and why we hadn't heard about it, you know, a little bit of retconning mm -hmm. and why we hadn't heard about it up until this book. Which was a good thing to see because, yeah, it was definitely um, something we didn't know about, whether people cared about it, like uh, maybe outside of us. Well, yeah, what I was going to say is if if you were familiar with the story of Gambit, you know, mm -hmm. upon his upon his introduction in the early 90s, mm -hmm. then you might it might have crossed your mind pretty much only if you were connected to if you had a connection to uh, some of the other characters who were thieves. Uh, in the Marvel Universe, and the only other one that really got any sort of play was the Black Cat. And right. that was in the Spider-Man corner of the universe, so if you weren't as well-versed, and back in the day, especially in the in the 80s and 90s, a lot of people were X-Men only. Right, so or even I would just say, even if you your, your corner coming into this was from the X-Men animated series, where they had the one the, the one uh, two Gambit focused Thieves Guild, you know, right. uh, episodes. Right. So if that was your main focus, if, if the X books were your main focus at that time, then you really didn't have a chance to connect to the other parts of the uh, Marvel Universe, you know, at least with regards to Thieves. But now they're all playing nice together. 
Right, because even coming into this book, we were like, there, there's another guild outside of the one we knew about with the Xbox, and yeah, and like I said, it all paid out coming into this issue. Exactly. With so it was, it was good for me. Yeah, I was about to say credit to McKay for waiting until issue seven to really put that in there. Like yeah. it, he, you know, like it, <coughs> excuse me, it was teased, and we, you know, and and what we discussed was basically conjecture up until now, and now it's been confirmed, which is great. It actually, to me, I had a lot of fun seeing um, McKay really weave in the Marvel continuity and really entrench the Thieves Guild into the history of the Marvel universe. Indeed, indeed, yeah. So, you know, where it goes from here, we will see, see, but hey, given what we have now, like that opens it up to, you know, some other things that could potentially happen. Definitely, like, definitely. Online. And what's funny about it is, you know, we have um, the mention of uh, an external, which is from, uh, you know, the, the Gambit story as well, mm -hmm. the Kandra, and... Um, you know, and, and the fact that this guild uh, business is, is is international, you know. Indeed, indeed. So, yeah, like I said, whether to go back into the Xbox, given what's going on there anymore, and Gambit's kind of busy with, uh, with a, actually, with a book from this week. Right. Um, but whether that is going to go back to the X part of the corner or... Gambit's busy playing D&D &D right now. He's <laughs> exactly. He's leveling... Wait, did you see about that in my notes, or did you have that in yours also? No, I read it. Oh, okay, I read it. I don't. I don't know if I put it into my. Because I noticed that. Because I noticed that exact same thing. Which we, you know what? If we since. Oh no, I did. I did. Yeah. Okay. More direct. Well, we can talk about it now. Yeah, I'm about to say. Yeah, let's go ahead and get into Excalibur three right now. Then that. Means... All right. All right. So that was, that was the indirect tie. I wasn't expecting to go into, but sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, because uh, because ultimately, what 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 which what uh, really stood out to me in this book is that there's more direct. A, D, and D references in the story. Yes. Um, like, really, like, on the nose direct. I loved it, yeah. Um, you know, including dragons. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, another generation of Excalibur comes into the story, as well as a former member of X-Force. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I was about to say, were you talking about the same person? No, you know, I know who you're talking about now. Yeah, so basically, mm -hmm. so the, the short of it, we see uh, a mutant we haven't seen in a while since, since, like you said, X Force Richter, who's in a somewhat of a state. You know, right. I guess he wanted to go to uh, Krakoa, but he, but he was too scared because his powers are acting up or whatever the case may be. Right. But apparently, Apocalypse came along later on and be like, nah, you, you come on, I, I need you. <laughs> So we'll see how that's going to play out. But it, and on the other side of that, we see, you know, uh, Captain Britain, a bit, uh, Betsy, and uh, the rest of the crew in Avalon, where Shogo turned into a dragon when they cross over, which had me thinking two things. Well, one, with the Richter thing, I'm like, with well, Richter's powers are going crazy, where are the Morlocks? The Morlocks? Yes. And, I, and they say that for a specific reason because they are mutants. One, so why? So are they on Krakoa? Or are they planning on going to Krakoa? The healer is there. The Do Morlock. The Morlock healer is there. Okay, but a, most of I was thinking like Leech, because you would think they would have like pulled him in. Huh? He's with the Future Foundation. He's in space. Leech. Yeah, Artie and Leech. They're with the Future Foundation. Are you? Oh yes, they are. You're right. I totally forgot about damn. I never read the book too. You're right. So there you go. Never so forget about that part. And then <laughs> that's all right. Never mind. But the rest of them still, but the, even still then, the rest of them, you know, like where are they? But so yeah, future foundation space, and I totally forgot about the they were there. So and and obviously Richter has a tie to them anyway, because I think I'm fairly certain they were all X Factor. They were all in X Factor together anyway. But that's beside the point because you know, like I said, this just had me thinking about where where were the Murlocs in general. You know, right. I've, I have seen the Morlock healer. He's definitely there, you know, when they're trying to heal up um, uh, during the X-Force issue, I think. Mm -hmm. If you look around, like, he's the he's the guy with, like, the, the goatee beard. Right. He, he looks like he's a wizard. You know, I hate to say he's like a Gandalf-looking dude mm -hmm. with no hat. Um, that's I, the Morlock yeah. healer. Okay. Maybe I was just thinking about somebody else that was him, but okay. So yeah, that's kind of what I was. was I didn't pay attention to who that was. So there was that part, and like I said, the, everybody, uh, the rest of Excalibur is in um, uh, is in Avalon, where Shogo turns into a baby, which had me thinking about 
I feel like at some point in the past, they've been to Avalon before, one, when the, the OG Excalibur was in the group. And that being the case, if I'm maybe, I'm probably getting this wrong, but Lockheed was probably with them. So, and this is just my my crazy thing. I'm like, wait, so if Shoko goes into the portal, turns into a dragon when he gets to the other side of Avalon, if Lockheed goes in there, does he change also? Into a baby? <laughs> yeah, or something. Yeah. Or like in some sort of human form, you know, dragon, you know. I, I thought about that for a minute. I was like, well, wait a minute. He's already a dragon, so would he just, you know, flip the other way or something? But I, I feel like that's probably happened and nothing happened on that front. And Shogo's probably, dude, there's going to be something coming out of that from Shogo. Like maybe we'll find that he's a shapeshifter and they'll have to call him Megan or something. Mm. <laughs> which, we'll see. Which actually, given what uh, the list that, that shows up at the end of this book, maybe that's going to happen. Uh, because they're in Avalon and, and Gambus was worried about Rogue and, you know, Betsy's worried about Brian and Jubilee is obviously worried about uh, Shogo, who's a big dragon now. Um, so she spends most of the issue being more worried about him than what she's doing. Which you know, has a baby. What you, you know, what you, what you can say. But who thought about that from Jubilee? First of all, <laughs> her can't invite anybody else for herself, especially if you're, you know, you know, '90s X Men animated series version. Sure. But um, but going back to what we were talking about, yeah, there's definitely a f- a, f- a few different references to the in- the including one from uh, Gambit mm-hmm. <laughs> talking about. So we're supposed to be just walking around for a few weeks and hope to level up. Mm-hmm. Like, it's like, okay, I didn't know you played Gambit, but it makes sense because he's already the thief, so he's his his class is already built in. <laughs> it's fun. So, and then there was a couple of others in, in uh, outside of that. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed this issue. That being being said, with all of that, you know, it was like I'm still not entirely sure what. But then again, you could say that about the, the OG X. I'm not sure where this is going. Mm-hmm. Like, you know where kind of it's going like, or where it's centered around and we definitely see well clearly they're bringing in they're bringing in some x um an x x caliber folks including who shows up at the end of this this issue right another previous incarnation of the team exactly and given the list like i said uh of, that they showed with previous members on it you know i suspect at some point they will probably come back in the book at some point we know kitty pride's kind of or excuse me catherine Pride is off doing her own thing, yeah. so you know I'm sure. And the way the X books have been running, in the way they kind of been, you know, they they tie into each other's books. So cool. Uh, I guess since we're already in the X corner, we want to go to. I know you said you hadn't read X Men. Did you read Marauders? I did. I just didn't uh, type it in. Okay. So yeah, we'll do that one. Um. And maybe we'll go ahead and wrap it for after that. You got it. Uh, so, yeah. So, this one basically centered around Sebastian Shaw. And um, I guess it goes back a little bit. Um, or at least it seems to. Right. Because we start off, uh, Xavier's still alive. So, clearly, this is in the past. Right. There, yeah, There's definitely an arc within this book of mm-hmm. a time arc uh, for Sebastian Shaw. Right, and the and the reason for that is because there's uh, another mutant, which I don't know about too much about um, his kinfolk, uh, but uh, Sebastian Shaw's son, who apparently died by a, a or a seemingly died by a person who we just mentioned, if I don't remember him dying, I had to look exactly, that. exactly, I had to look that up. Yeah, see, I'm like, I don't know who this person is. Well, I live for that. I remember mentioning I remember mentions of him, but I don't think I've ever read anything with him specifically and I definitely don't remember when he you know, when he had supposedly died. Well, remember, he was he was uh one of the pr- the, the the prime characters that was bet- behind um uh Psylocke, you know, the initial transformation between the Mandarin, Shaw, right. you know, but during the whole uh Acts of Vengeance thing. Right. But again, like I said, that's that's like that's a long time ago, right? Exactly. From then to, yeah. yeah. So from then to then, so basically what happens is, spoiler alert, um, uh, Sebastian Shaw's son comes back to life because of the resurrection protocol. Right. Uh, and Sebastian Shaw kind of takes it upon himself to reacclimate his son, who apparently still has, or at least at the beginning though, still has a thing against Sebastian Shaw, which I don't kind of blame him, to be honest. Right. 
Um, and he's also, he's been portrayed as like kind of the estranged, it's estranged yeah. son. So, right. but being this is a new state of state for the mutant kind, this seems to be you know some of that old animosity was still there, but it just seemed to be kind of ironing out during the course of this issue, uh, including Sebastian Shaw's somewhat skewed version of the events leading to um, his status right now. But of course, you know, you know, his son don't know any better, so you know, he can say what he want. Um uh but his also his son has uh has his own little dealings elsewhere, going back to um what Agent 70 just said, which I assume is going to come into play again at some point. But it's all set up for Sebastian Shaw setting up up the way that uh Emma set up um Basically, the same setup as Emma did with Catherine, Sebastian's kind of doing with his son, Mm -hmm. except for the fact that the difference is Emma got what she wanted out of the deal, which is the third member of um, the Hellfire Clubs. Well, who of the, I can't remember what what did they call those? The inner circle. The inner circle. Yes. So they got their third member through uh, Emma Shaw as opposed to how, how Sebastian Shaw wanted it, which also is an underlying thing in this, which didn't get to happen as we saw last issue. Um, and as uh, Agent 7 said, there was an arc, which I don't think they even addressed that part of it, but we kind of see that it was a thing that happened. Right. I mean, you can definitely tell that there's an arc to this individual story because, you know, and it covers a certain amount of time because Pyro doesn't have that awful face tattoo. Exactly. Um, right, because yeah. this, this starts when he first, when he and other folks first get resurrected. Exactly. exactly. So, um, so you know, I, you know, ultimately, this book seems to be very much focused upon um, the Hellfire Shipping Corporation and how um, the various players in um, the Krakoa shipping business, the shipping lanes business, are going to be interacting. So. There's Kitty or Kate Pride and her crew, mm-hmm. and Sebastian Shaw and whatever he's doing, and Emma Frost and whatever she's doing. So yeah, this book is definitely seemingly going to be about about plots and schemes of horror. Which right. in the bigger stream of the scheme of the X Men, they've got bigger fish to fry. But at the same time, hey, you know, you gotta you gotta work all your angles where they need to, I guess. Right. And even Shaw and says in here is like, hey, this, there's a necessary thing that that, that is needed here, and. You know he's trying to take care of that part, so we'll see how that how that works out for him. Right. Um, you got a book you want to throw out? Uh, just one, and then I guess we'll go into rapid fire. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to talk about Daredevil number fourteen quickly. Thought you might. Uh, Daredevil and Detective Cole North have a heart to heart in this issue, literally over coffee. Um. You know, in the light of day, Matt Murdock is is running around in a very Netflix style black, uh, black, uh, uh, you know, mask tied over his head, you know, with a hood. And um, basically, he and Cole North have a heart to heart. And uh, Murdock gains some clarity in his personal life where Cole North is trying to deal with. Um, this different way of looking at uh, costumed characters. Um, we also find that Matt Murdock is gaining some clarity in his crime fighting life as well as uh, an issue, uh, 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 I guess a several issue arc involving Electra is continuing. Uh, you know, she, she continues to be a guest star in this book, providing uh, Matt Murdock with some, uh, refresher courses on uh, martial arts and being a superhero. So um, that's essentially uh, where this book is. It's it's moving at a decent pace uh, for anyone who is a Daredevil fan. I think this is a definitely a good time to jump on because they've gotten a lot of the emotional stuff out of the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I got a question. Um, he's still not back in the suit, correct? Not yet. And are they still going along with that that new Daredevil thing that they were season a while back? Yes and no, because ultimately what they are doing is having people realize that Daredevil has quote unquote gone away, and having pretenders to the throne 
basically stepping in to fill the void and they're all getting their butts kicked because they're not trained. They're basically going in with Halloween masks. So um, eventually Daredevil will be called back into service, you know, sooner rather than later. Because I felt like they were touting, hey, this is going to be, it won't be Matt Murdock, but it's going to be this new Daredevil that's taking over, you know, that's going to be in place. And I wonder if they're not grooming this Detective North guy to do it. Right. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. But at the same time, you know, they're also, they also seem to be going in that direction of uh, reinvigorating Matt Murdock. So, mm-hmm. it, it, see how it does it. Yeah, gotcha. And we still don't know whether this cold earth has any relation to Dakota. Right, we don't know. Yeah, okay. Cool. Rapid fear. Rapid fire. So actually, I'm going to start off because I want to kind of pick up somewhat off of that last book, even though I don't have it in directly in my notes. Web of Black Widow, number four. Um, and uh, we will have some news to sort kind of sort of maybe possibly um related to this book we don't we still have yet to figure that out yet but once we get to the cinematic version you know if you already know um so it starts off with uh, actually net in matt murdoch's apartment because this whole book has been about you know her dealing with things from the past uh one and there's this other black black widow going around with her face uh to which at the end of this book we find out who that is um uh, but along the ride, you know, she's already she's already um, run into Winter Soldier. So in this one, she's run into Daredevil or AKA Matt Murdock, um, who's you know being Matt Murdock because you know how he is when it's about people he cares about, you know. And then she runs around and turns into, of course, one of her other exes who, um, whom she's had a good relationship, or who she's had a relationship on and off the screen, in, in a way. And that would be one Clint Barton. Hawkeye, who um, gets wind of her dealings and comes to bring her in, and you know their history gets gets brought up. Of course, going back to Iron Man, which they both were uh, both uh, villains in the early days of, and they even footnote that it there in this book. And there's um, a couple of scuffles happens between them, so maybe a misunderstanding or two. And then, like at the end of the book, we find out. Um, who this other widow is, uh, and it is a person from her past, of course, that uh, has been going around impersonating her. Uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and say it now, because this will probably come up later, may or may not have something to do with the movie that's coming out. Okay. I don't know that for certain, but it just kind of, the theme seems to be going that way. Uh, that being said, next book is, talk about those, those, those. Uh, X-Men number three, uh, which I know Agent 70 has not read, so I won't spoil it for him. Uh, this is basically another min- uh, mission, actually with um, um, Sebastian Shaw, uh, Emma Frost, and Scott um, going to deal with some shenanigans in the, the uh, Savage Land because they have a portal there which someone hacked. Uh, for a particular reason, and they have to go and investigate. And it's also almost literally reverberating with Krakoa, who apparently feeds off psychic energy. So therefore, it's a it's a threat in a couple of different ways. Um, and um, to some somewhat hilarious, um, um, there's a couple of uh, pretty. I don't want to say hilarious. Hilarious is, is pretty hyperbolic these days, especially with articles and whatnot. But it's pretty funny. Uh, some dialogue that's going on, and the fact that they're what they're who and what they're dealing with kind of gets the best of them in a, in a ways. And yes, it, this is on a human front, so you know, there's they still have that thing kind of attacking on them, or which I guess is going to come back. Um, if the end of the, the issue is any indication, is going to come back and, and be an issue on another front, as if you know, as if the X Men already didn't already have enough. Uh, coming at them, but otherwise, that it's a it's a pretty good. I this is my particular quick work, and it's a, it's a great one. I I thought um, magnificent Miss Marvel number ten, which I don't have in my notes, but I did read. I literally finished reading this as we were prepping because you and I both have been on this on top of this book. 
Um, so yeah, this is um, continuation of last issue. Mr. H- she's, uh, Kamala's chasing Mr. Hyde uh, as her father's undergoing surgery from Doctor Strange uh, to try to, you know, fix what is going on with whatever illness he's going on, which has something to do with his inhuman genes. Uh, which you know we don't get we don't get anything final from that even though it it kind of seemed like we were going to but I guess they they're gonna drag it off for one more issue but we what we do find out which is something I thought would have been um, I thought they would have left this for a couple more issues we come to find out uh, there's more to which we already knew there was more to Kamala's suit than what we knew about it and we kind of feel like we called it even when we first uh, yeah come across it and it comes to find out that yeah that's kind of a case where the suit while being a different origin from Spidey's symbiote suit kind of has a similar thing going on to it so they don't stray too far away from that and we come to find that out at the end of this issue right I mean the cover of the issue in which the costume was introduced was an homage to Secret Wars number 8 Yep, itself so the uh, the, the hints were there from yeah. the beginning and they were you know, it was definitely not it was definitely kind of out there like and we like that even when we read the issue and saw that even outside of seeing that like okay yeah this seemed like this is where this was going so it, it was just kind of telegraphed basically right and it's obviously different but there's you know it's mm-hmm. definitely more tech based mm-hmm. uh, but uh but yeah when i read it, i was like oh yeah, that's kind of a bummer, but at the same time, maybe they'll still like. Well, hey, Solomon Sol- 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 Ahmed's a great writer. I feel like he might throw a spin in there. Yeah, we'll see. So um, that that'll that'll make this different. But yeah, as we know it now, there's definitely similarities. Um, that again, surprisingly, came out earlier than I, I suspected it would. I figured they would have dragged it on a little bit longer than that. But uh, nevertheless, here we go. In the midst of what else is going on? Sure. Uh, and that, I guess, will be it for me. All right. So, uh, President Bartlett. What's next? I'm going to hit the few that I've got, and then I'll read through what PCN underscore Dirt has for this week. Mm-hmm. Um, the rest of the books that I have are, um, I read two of the Annihilation Scourge books out this week. Um, the first one, and it's um, actually, I think it's important to read Annihilation Scourge Fantastic Four number one first. Because I believe this is also in the reading order. So it seems that it seems that it's important. It's it's somewhat important to read it first because uh, Annihilation Scourge Nova number one seems to follow in the footsteps of the FF book. So um, I won't spoil too much. I think uh, Roddy Cat plans on reading this. I will just say since we we talked about the Scourge one shot two weeks ago. Um, our theories regarding the century were debunked in this issue. Okay, that's so maybe it, good to know. What's that? I said maybe that's good to know. I don't know. Right. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, you'll see how. Right. We'll see how. So I'm not really spoiling too much. Um, in the Nova issue, uh, Nova is shook from his time in the cancer ver- cancer verse. Um, so he's, uh, you know. He's kind of a halfway crook that way. I feel and, like I feel like I called that one also because they're, they're, they're because even though there was been some of that, like you said, has been dealt with in the novel book before, I feel like he was still had some of that on him. Right, he's definitely got some PTSD mm. um, from his time in the cancer verse and having been possessed by um, uh, some entity from the cancer verse, and that actually is dealt with in this issue. Um, and he's not facing about, he's not happy about facing uh, the Revengers again. Um, uh, you know, along with the Sentry, who's a a, a, a prime character in the Scourge uh, crossover event. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Oh, that pretty much covers it for my rapid fire books. I'm just going to just do a quick overview of um, PCN underscore Dirt's books. I actually did read Batman number eighty four. Uh, I de- I definitely agree with many of PCN underscore Dirt's following sentiments. Ugh! Wasted a whole issue on flashbacks to show why Thomas Wayne uh, turned against Bruce. And it still doesn't make sense. Thanks for stealing another $4 from me, Tom King. Um, 
The next book I'm going to discuss is actually a candidate for Dirt's Click of the Week, and that is Over the Ropes number one. It looks like it's a comicsology uh, digital comic, and it is a very real look at the quote fake unquote look world of professional wrestling. So much of this rings true and even mirrors some things he himself has experienced um, as part of uh, uh, the world of uh, professional wrestling. Good story, fun art style, certainly a must for any wrestling fan. Sounds cool. Interesting. And the last book that PCN underscore Dirt read this week was The Butcher of Paris Number 1, another comicsology digital comic. This is the true story of a serial killer who used the Nazi occupation of France to hide his murder spree. It was paced very well, and the art invokes the classic French comic style. It's honestly better than he anticipated. It's a good book for horror fans and history buffs looking for one of the greatest forgotten serial killers of all time. Okay. I'm actually glad to see uh, Dirt. um, uh Uh-oh. Yeah, I mean, do that. I'm actually glad to see him um, going through this comic because there are some actually some gems in those in the original stuff that unfortunately, you know, won't get wide press or or much else because they're there and they don't get uh, and they're digital exclusives one and they're they're on the cosmology, which you know which means they don't get um, you know they they don't get the uh, exposure exposure yeah of, of the print books. So, and like I said, like I said, there's usually some gems in there at, at some point. So it's worth going in there to check some things out. If you have like uh comes out of the unlimited or whatnot, cause you never know, you might be able to find some stuff. You got it. All righty. So I think we're coming up on clicks of the week. Mm-hmm. And uh, we got two weeks worth to go with, at least for some of us. Anyhow. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do our we'll do our clicks for last week first. Yes. Because uh our co-host did not submit clicks of the week for last week. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to go with I'm gonna go ahead and go with uh <laughs> nice. I'm gonna go ahead and go with New Mutants number two. I enjoyed that book. That was good. Yeah, I'll that hold was it. good. That was good. Listen, I have I'm I'm in between like three books for for myself because i had a lot of fun reading jane foster valkyrie yes a lot of fun reading that i, I definitely enjoy reading that book all the time oh, I, yeah, what I mentioned about that one was is is it's the end of the arc and it ends on a a better note for her right so right i also i also agree with your with your choice of new mutants number two i like that i'm really that's really um uh, a good contest and i like that x-force number two was a solid follow up to the first issue, to the events of the first issue. Mm-hmm. So that's why I was playing the 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 uh, the final Jeopardy clock because I am actually in between these three books and I'm not sure what I'm going to pick. Mm. And I want to mention something we forgot to mention about Avengers 27. Um, um, Hulk, aka She Hulk, got a new costume out of. Deal, which is pretty much uh, seems to be the most revealing costume she's had to date in this new incarnation. Uh, I think ever, but yes, really. <laughs> I would. I mean, if you go back to through the course of her, you know, her costumes over the age, like she's pretty much had definitely had more clothes on than than that. Really, but, but I feel like it anyway. Um, I mean, obviously, classically, she had the one piece, you know, you know, uh, most of the times. But this one was like, okay. But supposedly, I, and actually, I mentioned in my notes, I'm like, okay, so they really don't, they don't know how to, they still don't remember, know how to costume. Jokingly, still said that they don't know how to costume women in, anymore. But you know, it's she Hulk, whatever she wore outside of the unstable. Oh woman. yeah, well, you know, I mean, especially with her new physique or with her more bulked up physique, you know, right, right. But right. still, that's like you couldn't give her a little bit more than that. <laughs> Not complaining, but no, hey, love me some Chucky, but <laughs> all right, exactly. Anyway. All right, um, we've stalled long enough. I've got to make a decision between these three books. I am going to go with... Oh, man. 
How do you like them apples? Jane Foster Valkyrie number five. <laughs> that came in a close for the close second was probably X Force number two and New Mutants number two tied. I mean, not a bad pick, regardless. Yeah, Jane Foster Valkyrie number five is my click for click of the week for last week. Or Valkyrie Jane Foster number five, whichever exactly. they still that's still that's still a weird one because they have it in a couple of places differently. Exactly, exactly, exactly. All right. So now we move on to clicks of the week for this week. Mm-hmm. And we have some clicks provided by our co-hosts in Absentia. Indeed. And the first one being uh PC underscore dirt with um I guess no surprise. Over the ropes number one, which uh um agent under skip seventy read his notes off for so we don't have to really go back on that. Right, 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 right. And and uh Tim D O double G nine eight submitted X Men number three as his click of the week for this week. And he, as he said himself, that's the only one he read. So I'm not to put him out there like that. But I, even regardless, like I said, I enjoyed that one also. And that is also a potential click of the week for me, y'all. All right, all right, all right. That's nice. All right. Uh, what am I going to pick for this week? This week's a little uh, tougher for me. I'm going to miss this morning voice, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, we if we recorded at 5 o'clock in the morning before I had to get up to go to work, that would be something else. Yeah, all right. So let's see here. Uh, what did I enjoy this week? Uh, it was a little tougher for me to find something this week. I wonder if um, what would I put in for this week? It's a good question. So it was a lot this week, and you know, due to various things and that being a lot of them, we couldn't get to everything that we wanted to be this week, but you know. I, I would like to believe, just, just like uh, myself, Agent Seventy has a has a plan when he goes through his books, and I think pretty much everybody does. You know, a certain order they they like to go into for one reason or another. Right, and I definitely missed out on reading a couple of things like the latest Ragnarok, mm. the assignments and stuff that came out this week, the latest Ragnarok and the Thor, uh, the Worthy book. So right. it was surprising that I didn't get to it, but we also didn't want to overwhelm. Uh, the show with uh, a million books for each week, so right. Um, and time constraints, you know, yeah, so. exactly, exactly. Time constraints being what they are, I think what I'm going to choose from what I have read this week probably Daredevil number 14. Although I did love Black Cat number seven, and I'm actually thinking twice about what I just said, but I think Daredevil, Daredevil number 14 is probably the strongest book uh, that I read this week. Hmm, okay. Um, for me, it's and this is weird for me to say. It's, well, it's not even weird because I've been loving this run of the X books, but and I'm not classically. I'm more of the Avengers fair than you know than the X Men uh, historically. But there have been runs of X Men that I've enjoyed. That being said, um, out of the stuff that I've read, I guess the, the more compelling stuff has been. The, out of the X corner, and I guess I'm, you know what, I will go with Tim on that one because I, I very much enjoyed that X Men three, uh, X Men number three book because it was nice. quite humorous. Very, all, very okay. nice. So with that, we will transition to the cinematic news. But first, our first ad read of the night. Our first ad read of the night is for my comic shop. Today's podcast is sponsored by my comic shop. Go to cspn.us, then click on the Keep Our Podcasts free link at the top of the page. From there, click on the My Comic Shop banner and order from a vast selection of new releases, back issues, vintage classics, graphic novels, and more to be delivered right to your door. You should support your local comic shop. But if you are unlucky and do not have a local comic shop to support, then you can order your books online through my comic shop through cspn.us. Do it today. And now we get into the news. Probably what I want to do, and probably something that should have I've been should have done already, but like just clip out the ad uh, as he, and just. Let it be canned like that, but right. do, do things canned like that. But I think this specific one I might end up doing. 
we'll see how lazy I get, but we'll see about that. But let's get into the cinematic news, as you said. Um, as I pull up the sheet, yeah, as I scroll and scroll through the sheet, because we have two weeks of books for everybody, so we did indeed. And I tried to do my best to kind of put some stuff. Now, so if you are, um, if you do have the show notes, which I hopefully will be uh, in the post uh, uh, on both the video and uh, on CSPN.us, which I don't think I actually remember saying at the top of the show, but CSPN.us and uh, other places. Uh, but we'll get to that later. Uh, you will see that the, there's a chock full of stuff news wise and also in the clickbait section, which you should go check out because there's some really notable stuff that uh, you, you might want to check out. So, CW's Crisis on Infinite Earths Key Art Unites the DC Multiverse. Uh, if you're watching the video, you can see the, the picture in question. Um, so, yeah, all of the disparate parts of uh, the, the, the Arrowverse come together on one poster. And um, I'm still not caught up on Arrowverse right yet, so yeah. All so, right, that's uh, actually that's next week, folks. Uh, so if you hadn't been caught up, if you're not caught up by now, like me, maybe get caught up soon if you're interested. Still interested because we know that's right. Soon. Next, there is a report that Star Girl is going to debut on the CW's Crisis crossover. So this is actually according to Business Insider. And um, Stargirl, which is supposed to stream on the DC Universe streaming service, mm -hmm. is going to also appear in Crisis on Infinite Earths, which will bring together the Arrowverse heroes. And, um, you know, the announcement also had something about the slew of special cameo appearances by previous iterations of these characters from other DC uh, related shows. Which may or may not give credence to a rumor from a while back that said that um, possibly the DC Universe uh, versions of like will were supposedly showing up on Crisis of Infinite Earths, which I think had been debunked, especially the Titans part. Right. But this is kind of giving a little bit more cre credence on one side of that, right? Which is also weird because like okay, so this one gets it, but gets to so she gets to come on. But if this is even true, like it's still a report at this point. But they didn't do Titans, which you know, Titans is a little bit more adult. I think that's why. Well, yeah, but hey, we don't know what she they're doing with this one. I was about to say, let's not talk about. Did we did we put anything in there about the Titans season two wrapping up? Uh, I, you know what? I'm, uh, there is something about Titans, yes, but I'm not sure if it's about that. I will rant and rave. I, I honestly thought about doing a Treasury edition to talk about this. So, yeah, I still need to catch up. Um, I, I heard things. So, but, um, and speaking of, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Um, the CW to air Stargirl reruns a day after their DC Universe debut. So, that's interesting. Well, that's uh, cool to get uh, exposure. Yes, exactly. Which, I feel like when I mean, granted, so Titans originally was supposed to be on like TNT or something like or something like that before they decided to put it on U to DC Universe. I'm kind of slight, still slightly surprised that they didn't do that, even though like that is a little more dating. But TNT would have been probably a better place to not for that if they were right. going to do it. So yeah, um, but I guess the direction they're going with this one, I guess it would make sense for them to put it on CW. And if the other the the last story is to, is to be true. Um, then yeah, they're gonna, they're, they're sure it makes some sort of sense, I guess. I'm like, okay, yeah, basically. Um, obviously, we're probably gonna be on CWC also, which is their other streaming service, but you know, it, was, it is what it is on that. So, but like you said, it's more exposure. Next, the Flash's mid season finale is building to the first chapter of Crisis on Infinite Earth. So, this is uh, this week. Mm hmm. Which I th think was probably has um, aired already. Yes, so you would have probably have already have seen that by the time this, uh, by the time you get to this this show, right? And if you haven't, time to catch up. Basically, like we just said, a uh, long time the Adam fan, Osric Chow, on bringing Ryan Choi to the CW Arrowverse for Crisis on Infinite Earths. So yes, this is uh, apparently at the time of this uh, article went out, they still haven't fitted him for a suit. Which is weird. So uh, yeah, so he's playing Ryan Chor, the other Adam. Um, 
Uh, but this was basically an article with him about his, you know, uh, uh, about him, his, you know, being a fan of the Adam One and being able to to bring him to life. I guess I didn't, I didn't really go through the whole article, admittedly. Okay. Uh, so I remember reading. Uh, I feel like I read like the first issue or two of that run of the Adam, which was a uh, Gail Simone written. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I guess Greg Rantmaster also writ, uh, helped created them. But I do remember the the series where Gail Simone wrote. Gail Simone wrote. I'm like, yeah. Sure. All right. Uh, next up, uh, the Arrowverse may be headed for a big post-crisis time jump. So in the aftermath of this uh, Crisis on Infinite Earth story, um, I'm not sure if they if the article has something about the, the, the amount of a time jump, but there is a rumor that it's going to be going that way. Right. So apparently because of this, the so Arrow is going to end, I guess. Um, well, we know Arrow is going to end, and it sounds like, uh, yeah, according to this, the final episode of the Arrow is going to end after the event, uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths. So assuming that being the case, whatever happens then. Uh, and if rumors are to be true, I guess there, there's probably a reason for that because there are some rumors, especially dealing with uh, Green Arrow and his involvement with the, um, with the, uh, with the event. That might lead some, some credence to it. It's leading up to a finality in a couple of different ways. Let's say, so we'll see if that holds true. Uh, Smallville's Lois Lane talks to bizarre crisis reunion. Speaking of Lois Lane, that came out this week and I didn't get a chance to read it and I'm upset with myself because I've been loving that book. Uh, Erica Durant, who played, um, who played Lois Lane on Smallville, you know, basically this is an article talking about, you know, um, you know, her doing this, uh, reunion with her Smallville cohorts and in this big event, Crisis on Infinite Earths. You can check that out, you know. Which, if you read into name weekly, you probably already have. But if you haven't, hey, there you go. This this article kind of paraphrases all that. Next, all righty. Um, Smallville's Aquaman explains why he is not in Crisis on Infinite Earths. So this is actually the actor who plays Hawk in the new in the current Titans show, mm-hmm. uh, Alan Richson. So basically, he said that uh, he was busy. He was he was offered the opportunity to come back and return as Aquaman um, for Arrow, you know, in the Arrowverse. But uh, he was unfortunately too busy filming Titans at the same exact time. Which I did not know that was him, to be honest. But then I didn't. There, I only watched so much Smallville, and once they started doing that whole Super Friends thing, I think I had already checked out by that time and i could have sworn i i I confused this dude with the guy that's on now on uh this is us uh justin hartley i believe in them who's also on a uh, soap opera that uh i used to watch uh and i know he played green arrow i believe on smallville if i'm not mistaken but i thought he was the one who also played because he was supposed to get um uh an aquaman spinoff from Smallville that never happened. I think they shot a pilot or didn't something happened and that and didn't happen, but it's apparently it was this dude. Still didn't happen. So it is what it is. But hey, he's he's Hawk now. So yay. Supergirl star Melissa Bonoist opens up about her experience with domestic violence. So yeah, this uh happened uh excuse me actually the day before uh Thanksgiving where this uh where this happened. She was on uh Instagram's IGTV and revealed her history as a survivor of domestic violence. And, um, you know, as the internet tends to do, had words about it, for better or for worse. So, and and um, as an addendum, I think some of her co, uh, co, um, co-stars co also, you know, lended their support to her for, you know, for coming out with her story. So, and I believe one of them may have, it might be in the story, and probably not, but no, but, this, but that stuff is out there regardless, so... There is that. Uh, next up. Uh, regarding Titans, 
Uh, Warner Brothers revealed a first official look at the Nightwing suit that made its debut in the final episode of Titan Season 2. All right, go. I'm not going to rant because it's too much. <laughs> There's too much. Okay. We're trying to keep our tidy show, our, 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 our two week worth of uh, stuff show tidy. I mean, you felt like you had something to say. Go ahead. I, right. may, I may reserve this for. Um, uh, either a, I might do a post for the uh, uh, on on the Click Nation website. It might be uh, a lengthy Twitter rant. It might be an Instagram post. We will see. It might uh, be a right. treasury edition. I don't know if I want to warrant. You know, if I want to record an entire treasury edition on this, maybe if a you one of the hear, ones. If you want to hear, see that agent underscore seventy on Twitter. There you go. Uh, next up, Beast Boy visits his Doom Patrol pan with the family in Teen Titans Go. Um, so yeah, apparently a recent, uh, episode, I guess it was a recent episode of, uh, Teen Titans Go. Oh yeah, it's already aired. So yeah. So, and I guess it was a, um, that's what's up airing tomorrow, which is already passed. Uh, it's a slight adaptation of Doom Patrol for the Teen Titans Go continuity, yet still retaining their customary weirdness. It's not the first time we've seen Doom Patrol animated in Teen Titans Go style. That's true. Um, Young Justice Outside the Fan will re recall that producers Greg Weissman and Brandon Vietti uh, paid tribute to TGG's show, particularly since TGG gave some Young Justice love a years back uh, by featuring a Doom Patrol Go fantasy sequence in an Outsiders episode earlier this year. I do remember that, actually. Okay. Actually, you should, too, because uh, the Young Justice episode where they did that. I think so. Yeah. It was a uh, surrounding Beast Boy. But anyway, mm -hmm. so, cool. Yeah, that was a, this thing that happened and uh, I'm assume, I was assuming it was like Thanksgiving related, but uh, may or may not be. I'm not sure. Regardless, that was the thing that's out there. Next. All right, something I did not watch and did not realize was coming out over the Thanksgiving weekend. I did uh, watch it. <laughs> what if Harley Quinn left the Joker but ended up in the Legion of Doom? Apparently, that's what's happening in the upcoming DC Universe. Well, the now current right. DC Universe animated series, Harley Quinn. It uh, debuted this previous Friday, November 29th. And um, what they're teasing... The showrunners are teasing or dangling a Harley Poison Ivy romance for the show's future. Which, why dangle that when this already should be a thing? I don't know. I'm pretty sure there's some people saying that. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a thing. Uh, which was that? The next article, actually? No. Okay, DC Universe's Harley Quinn reinvents one major Batman villain. Um, the upcoming Harley Quinn animated series will offer a whole new take on the Batman villain vein, which I believe they've already um, um, had their sights on Kite Man because I thought I saw a still of a Kite Man into the picture. Also, uh, if you're watching the video, you will also see, which is another, uh, would have been another article that I decided not to put in there. Bernie the, the, um, Bernie the Beaver also shows up on the show, which if you've read uh, Harley Quinn's, um, not necessarily the most recent volume, but the the, the this um, the last couple of iterations of, that's probably this one, I'm kind of a little behind, but, but basically the, the current iteration of the Harley Quinn book uh, in volumes past had a beaver, a stuffed beaver named uh, Bernie. So they decided to put it in the, in the, um, the show. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Next. All righty. Uh, next up, uh, John Turturro, the actor, is joining the Batman as mobster Carmine Falcone. So, so there has been some very silly people are reacting to this in a very yeah. stupid way. Why? Yeah. Because now most of us of a certain vintage, or not even of a certain vintage, know John Turturro to be a fine actor. You know, a very well noted actor at sure. say. But uh and I believe one um picture that was going around was him from the Break the Big Lebowski, which is an older um an older right. as a matter of fact, yes, here we go. From Matt Reed specifically, he said uh, his, his on his Twitter when the, the announcement came out, he says, I said Carmine hashtag Carmine Falcone, and then there's a clip of uh him from the Big Lebowski, which is an old movie. 
And some people took that. There was like, well, well, why would they get him? Basically, it was like, why would they get him? Why didn't get somebody good or something? There was a whole bunch of stupid people who apparently don't know his chops talking about why he, you know, why he shouldn't have. Awful. It's Pino. It's also Kanish. <laughs> exactly. You know, like I'm talking about do the right thing and rounders. Exactly. So the, the, the yes, the man has had has has mucho chops. So it was like, okay, if you're gonna get somebody, maybe possibly chew up some scene one or two, but you know, I'd say that was a pretty good choice. <laughs> and I gotta do we don't we still don't even know what this what this Batman movie is gonna right. fully be. But regardless, there's okay. definitely some talent. Right. The one the one quibble I could understand is that I think the animated Carmine Falcone was uh depicted as more of a kingpin uh uh build type of guy. But yeah, yeah, that, he's still yeah, a even guy. Gotham, like even the Gotham version of uh Falcone was kinda he's not like big base stock here, but he kinda had a, a weight about him. Okay. You know. I mean I could understand that, but that's a minor quibble at this point. Well, yeah. So you, you know, know because he's not known for being like it's not like it's not like you're 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 casting somebody skinny to be kingpin, you know. Right. Well, I mean, technically, they kind of did, even though. Well, never mind. No, oh, they haven't. They never have. I know. Well, I know. Well, listen, I'm just saying that yeah. D'Onofrio, while not like big, big, he was not small either. Yeah, he's not a small. I was like, you don't remember him from uh, what you call it, Full Metal? Oh no, I totally do. Oh no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> that's, why, that's why. That's why I try to. Yeah. Protect himself. Like he's not like big, big. Like he was bigger when he did. Um, he was basically more king size, king king pain size when he was doing full metal jacket, full right. metal, yeah, full metal jacket, and he was young then. Right, right, right. He was when you know he was doing kingpin. Yeah, he was definitely like a big early dude when he was doing Law and Order. Exactly. So, you know. but anyway, just you know, hey, ton, John Turturro, whatever. Hey, he, the man's good. So let it let it ride. All right. Next up, J.J. Uh, Abrams courted for a new Superman film, according to a report. And this is where I say why, because he already has his film, his 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 hands in too much other stuff where he should, probably shouldn't at this point. And they couldn't find anyone else to do anything. Like, granted, this is important. Oh, we don't even know if it's like, huh? He's coming off Star Wars. What else is he working on? Well, it doesn't matter. He has worked on Star Wars. He's worked on Star Trek. He's his productions companies has something to do with um. With uh, Mission Impossible, which granted that's a minor franchise at this point, but still, he has had his his hands in some big franchises. And I'm just my thing was like, okay, he, you couldn't find somebody else to do this outside of him, which I know why you would do it because it's JJ Abrams and he's a big name. But right. they, could, they could try to find somebody else to do some things. Right. Well, the 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 uh, the the newer person that they have doing some things in their studio is Ava DuVernay, and she has recently given an update tongue-in-cheek about the new gods movie and um i like that segue that's good uh you know she's uh the update is she's writing with tom king like writing with tom king is like barda in a battle strong and fearing no man okay yeah she's you know ava duvernay i know that big barda fan and i'm not even joking when i say that because she's come out on a few occasions saying that which who doesn't love big barda Crazy people. That's who. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, that's that's um, that's a good sign. Hopefully, um, Infinity War deleted scenes reunited reunites Hulk and Black Widow, and whether it felt so good, we don't know. So, so yeah, a new deleted scene from Avengers Infinity War finds Hulk and Black Widow reuniting. I'm assuming this is probably on DC Universe. I don't know because I haven't really checked. DC it Universe? You mean Disney? Plus. Oh, sorry, Disney Plus. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was about to say, I'm like, because it's on. Um, it crossover. But no. Um, hey, they both start with D. Um, Funny. <laughs> but yeah, Disney Plus may have because I haven't really looked at the extra stuff they they have on there. But I know they do have some stuff. But, but it, regardless. Uh, Bruce Banner and the Hulk had some problems during the course of the movie. And the Infinity Saga was released, recently released, and is proving to be difficult for Marvel Cinematic uh, Universe fans to track down. It's available from a third-party sellers for an astronomical amount. So hopefully, oh, so basically, I guess this is from that big box, right? Uh, right, right, right. Um, 
will either make more or at the very least release a version that is not limited edition so all fans could check out the deleted scenes from the MCU or they will probably put it on Disney Plus. Right. It'll be on, on a release at some point. Yeah. So all right. So in um in that, what that's which is surprising for because obviously those a, a lot of fans would have probably had all those movies already. So therefore you wouldn't you would think that you know this wouldn't have no, moved as much as it did, or I want to juice gift Blu-ray box sets. Well, this is also true. So that probably won't happen until after the holidays because they want to juice sales of gift Blu-ray box sets. Because you know what happens with those, you know, for for fans who uh, got DVD sets or Blu-ray sets, you know, or or just collected as they went along, they might pass those on to family, friends, or recycle them or or, or sell them. So that's true. You know, just to get the collector's edition, so artificial scarcity. Anyway, next um, up, um, I was about to say next up is the big news from this past week regarding uh the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and that is the trailer, the the first teaser trailer for the Black Widow movie set to drop this May came out, and it came out overnight, and none <laughs> of us about it. We woke up to it basically. Yeah, I just saw the tweet from Tim. Was like he, somebody told him he almost do. Uh, I'm assuming spit up or or do a spit take. But his 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 tweet was differently worded uh, when he saw what time it was, and I was like, yeah, that was a weird timing because when I saw it, when I was got up that early, I'm like, that's a weird time to to push this out. It was like one or two in the morning, and I ended up cracking awake at like five something. Yeah, I was kind of around that time too. Yeah, and I saw the notification as I was turning my alarm off on my phone, and I was like, "Whoa, what is that?" Yeah, I was like, "Okay, they're just well, I guess Black Widow's about stealth, so why not?" <laughs> exactly. It was like, "Hey, good morning, you guys. yeah, good morning to you guys," you know, and you know, you could watch it a couple times on the way in, and I surely did. So, yeah. and assuming you did too, what'd you think? Absolutely, I liked it. It was good. I liked that. There was a nice uh, feel to it. There actually was a, a feel to it. Mm -hmm. Definitely was. And going back to what I was alluding to earlier with Web of Black Widow, which I do not know if it has anything to do with it. All I saw was one possibly joking tweet from Declan Shalvey and the writer of the current Black Widow book saying, basically, hey, <laughs> there's a multi-million dollar trailer about the about this character. Lucky dog. You right. know. So that thought that was funny. But from what I've seen in the trailer, it does seem like there are some stuff that happened in the book that that is uh, that kind of sort of played off in this trailer. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's not outside of the realm of possibly of something that wouldn't have happened in the past. Let's just gotcha. say, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Oh, uh, or in other, you know, in other um, miniseries, because it's not like so. Lenola uh, Belova, Yelena Belova shows up, obviously, because you know there's that, and then. Alexi Red Guardian shows up also, who I thought looked like dirt. I don't know if he got the joke or not. When I, I did, I, I did. Yeah, I don't know if sure if he if he if he did or appreciated it when I when I when I put that out there. But regardless, I'm like, huh, okay, so there's that. But regardless, you know, Black Widow's path. The only thing I well, no, Hawkeye did show up, so there is that. So yeah, this is kind of hitting on those beats. We still there's some still some questions about. Uh, this, but as I've seen another article basically saying that hey, they possibly could have set up a way for to bring her back. To which, so did Secret Empire, and so did the well, basically, so did Secret Empire, so, right? Right, so we don't know if they would do that yet, exactly. But yeah, it was a good trailer, and I, I enjoyed it. You know, I, I liked it. Just it's, it is weird to see this trailer it's still being a thing now, and because we should have probably had this movie years ago. But it is what it is. Stanley Tribute coming to ABC. Um, so apparently ABC will air a tribute uh, to the late comic book writer uh, Excelsior Stanley on December 20th. It's titled um, Celebrating Marvel's Stan Lee, the one hour special hosted by Clark Gregg, a.k.a. Coulson. Will explore the life and creation of the legendary Lee who passed away in December or in November 2018. Right, this was filmed during uh, right after uh, New York Comic Con wrapped. Hmm. So 
Uh, if you happen to see on social media, you happen to see the, some of the, the exclusive comics. Remember, do you remember that exclusive comic that Adam Kubert wouldn't sign? Uh, but it's like, yes. From. Okay. That's where this is from. So this this uh, was at a theater in New York City, um, and it was held right after um, New York Comic Con. So a lot of industry folks were already in town for the con, and they stuck around for uh, the filming of this special. So cool. You know, I'm glad to be able to see it on TV. I would have loved to be at the special though, at the filming though, right? The actual show that would have been awesome. Yeah, that would have been cool. Um, and I need to catch up on Agents of Shield because I think that's about to go off the air also. Uh, but next up, next up, Josh Trank uh, reviews his own Fantastic Four film, gives it a generous, 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 <laughs> and I mean generous. I still have yet to see this movie. Two stars. You got to let me finish. Two. Oh, you were taking all. <laughs> I mean, generous. I mean. <laughs> And even it. yeah, so the movie that was panned some part rightfully, some part very unfairly, um, you know, by by folks out and about. Apparently, he monthly gave himself that that score for his movie, which. What else was he supposed to do? Was he going to give it five stars? Probably, but then you know he would have caught hell for that. Right. So, and surprisingly, he didn't go middle row with three stars. So I guess maybe he's humbled enough to 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 uh, to ad, you know to admit that, that it wasn't a great movie. Hopefully, but you know it is an episode of what he said about it, and apparently this has come from um, his letterboxed review of the film, which. I don't know what that is. I guess it's a site of to, to, to this link and stuff. Whatever, but you can go check that out and say what he says in full about it. He even goes on jokingly to ponder the possibility of a trank cut. Oh no. Before saying, I'm not Zack Snyder, and da, 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 you know. Mm-hmm. Et cetera, et cetera. So yes. Haha. <laughs> Very funny. Funny. Next up, Marvel's Hellstrom adds Arrow alum in recurring role. So David. Munier, I hope I'm saying that right, plays oh right, the, the Russian broad broad for dude. Um Gregor on Arrow, uh, Ishmael Gregor has on joined the cast of the upcoming Hulu series Marvel of Hellstrom, which the last we checked was still kind of up in the air, I thought, given one report. But I guess they're still going along with it. So anyway, he'll according to deadline, he will start as Finn Miller, who is quote unquote a part of a secret organization that handles work not for the faint of heart. Psst, sounds like wet work to me. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, cool. I guess that's still a thing that's gonna happen. Next. Uh next up, um Disney Plus is having some new stuff come to the service. Um, you know, in addition to the uh, the original content that is content that is released every week, like The Mandalorian and High School Musical, the musical, the series, uh, <laughs> which drop every Friday, we're also getting um, some Disney Junior titles that are coming from other streaming services, like um, Miles from Tomorrowland and Henry Huggle Monster. We're as- we're also getting a basketball movie, Glory Road, as well as coming. Uh, straight off of its run on Netflix, Thor Ragnarok and Alice Through the Looking Glass, and also Garfield because Fox, right? Which wow. Um, also, Star vs. the Force of Evil that's that's coming on there, and a bunch of other stuff. We don't have to go through the whole list. And some Marvel, a couple of Marvel Rising things. Some of it's already out because it's, it's as we're recording, it is the fifth, and some of it has already come out, and some of it's kind of like the Mandalorian and like Agent uh, Seventy Six coming out weekly or whatever the case may be. So. And of course that Jeff Global Bloom uh thing, which I still haven't watched yet, but I hear good things. But right. then it's from people who already like Jeff Goldblum because it'll be nice to see uh, uh Ragnarok kind of fill that slot on the Marvel movie on the MCU list. So right. Cause there's not that much left that needs to be filled out. Although well, yeah. Well, Panther, I was gonna say Panther and Infinity War, those are two. Well, yeah, I know, Matt, but outside of that stuff, like yeah. I think, actually I hadn't really looked because I think there's some even some older stuff that may not have might Maybe either, but I, I'm maybe 
blinking. Uh, one thing, actually, real quick before I go on, there is one thing that I noticed that wasn't there is the Jindy Tartarowski's um, Clone War series. Right. So I was like, I wondered why that's not there, which that seems to oversight because it basically runs directly into episode three, which is on the site. Right. It's, um, it's um, kind of, it's kind of, you know, like I wonder if they're holding off until January. I don't know. We'll yeah, see. it seems, but it still seems weird for that one, given like they, since it does directly go into, but at the same time, you could probably make some of the cases out for some of the Marvel movies, I guess, even though some of that stuff is still tied up in other such places. So, um, yeah, but yeah, it is what it is. And there's some still stuff that's kind of out order, of order, order in that job, but you know, we've kind of talked about that in the past. Mm-hmm. The Mandalorian demand surges in debut week, but trails to Stranger Things, DC's Titans. So a weird thing happened when this, when um, the reason why I pulled this up, because I know I saw some chatter out there on the Twitters. Um, somebody was like, and granted, this person, I feel like has a biased bias in one way, shape or form. I won't go into that. But they were basically saying that um, DC's Titan, which, which has been out for a year, mind you, um, they were surprised that DC that the Mandalorian was not beating out <coughs> the Titans again. Oh. Titans has been out for a year already, and granted, yeah, the, 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 whether you have that particular service or not, and and I get what they were trying to say, which was like, yeah, Star Wars, you know, Star Wars seems to be a bigger thing than what not, but at the same time, it was like one, the first episode, and two, against a show that's been out for a year. I feel like that that's a comparison that probably is a little off right i would also just add quickly that i think um the economics of getting another streaming service is still a factor because in my thanksgiving conversations with family i was surprised to hear surprised honestly surprised Mm -hmm. certain family members who still have little kids in their family not getting disney plus right away Right. And I was honestly very surprised by that. So I think the economics of uh, adding yet another streaming service has started to kick in just a bit right. with some people. So I think that's oh, totally. also a factor. I right. thought that was a factor with DC Universe, but at least with DC Universe, you're getting comics. So, right. Um, and, even, and, and even with that, because you remember there was a story a couple of weeks back when we, um, when we, when we last recorded that the, there was a surge in people getting just DC Universe. I mean, uh, excuse me, Disney Plus when it first came out. Like it right. had a big uptick when it came out, as opposed to people like us who had already gotten into it. Like you know, when they had announced it and put put it up for pre orders or whatever, or right, 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 right. ago. But apparently, when it came out, people were like, "Oh, it's out!" So, boom, which was a surprise, but was not a surprise um, in some way, shape, or form. So. Yeah, it's it's kind of weird how the how that stuff works out. And yeah, like you said, people are still trying to shake out their their streaming services. What they're doing about that? So. Exactly. Like they're they're basically trying to manage which streaming services they're going to get. So mm-hmm. so totally totally valid because there's a lot out there, and you know, it's not all worth it. All right. So speaking um, of Mandalorian, though, mm-hmm. uh, the show makes amends for a classic Star Wars plot hole. So this is something that came up over the course of the Mandalorian, in which um, the Mandalorian is ready to reverse the reputation of uh, Stormtrooper aim, in which, at least through the original trilogy, Stormtroopers couldn't aim for anything. They couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. Right. And I, as I said on Twitter, two things. One, I feel like plot holes probably a little hyperbolic because, I mean, like, yeah, that's been a thing. But at the same time, you could say that same thing about G.I. Joe because they never hit anything also. But that was right. just because it was a kid show. And right. when- I mean... I, I would just add that I honestly, you know, I came to Clone Wars late, but mm-hmm. I was honestly shocked to see, you know, clone stormtroopers actually hitting stuff. Oh, they totally, yeah, they was lighting stuff up. <laughs> so I was like, whoa, when did like that Jokers happen? Yeah, yeah, like Jokers were getting were getting lit up. So that's why I said like that whole this whole plot whole thing, like, okay, that happened maybe in the in the, you know, and even in the original trilogy, which granted there was like, I mean, excuse me, in the prequels, you know, there were and uh, granted, like you know, by the time you get by the time you get to the original trilogy, there are no longer clones. Well, the prequel. I mean, I mean the prequel. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But I'm talking about the you know those are conscripts in terms of the timeline. So sure. the the prequels have clones. So I think in the prequel t- trilogy, 
um, they had decent aim because they did. I think that was my point. Yeah. Yeah. They were hitting droids. And there was also, and I do rem- feel like I remember this, there was part of that, there was, I don't know if it was a theory or something that either Lucas or somebody said, it was like, well, no, there was basically a version of the rifles they were using that were, that was a bad batch, basically, and that's what mm-hmm. caused the aim, their, their aim to be bad at the time. And right. then, which I don't know if that was actually, the, or I'm dreaming it up, but I feel like I remember seeing that somewhere. So that, so this whole plot hole thing, it was like, it, it wasn't that, I don't feel like, it was a bad thing. Of the day. And one, like you said, like, no, we've kind of seen them kind of go well away from that or, you know, mm-hmm. it, fastly. So that was just a kind of a holdover for, and from an old thing. And it wasn't really a plot hole. It was just like, you know, that was just kind of what happened. Right. Like it was, they weren't basing the plot around the, the, the stone troopers aim. That, that's what I was like. That's not whatever. Anyway, that's, that's me nitpicking. So, but regardless, yeah, it seemed to be addressed well before now, but and the, People are just noticing in the men flooring that yeah you know, that's that's the thing anymore. Maybe they didn't watch Clone Wars, so who knows? Mm-hmm. Um, next up, Star Wars confirms why Django and Boba can't be Mandalorians. Uh, so this is a thought piece. So I'm not even going to go into too much of that, but basically, it's a it's a thing piece about you know that whole thing with B- uh, Boba and Django, which I don't. I feel like the prequels kind of. Mention that because, as, as you kind of know, um, especially if you've watched, like, say, Rebels and Clone Wars, like Mandalorian, like, what Mandalore is a place, and yes, there is a, a, a culture around it, uh, but it's not just like the race of people. In fact, I think they've, they've never said it was just the race of people because, as the Mandalorian has, um, has pretty much borne out, it's like, you know, people can kind of people have come in that are not. Of that place, right, or uh, of that culture. So, but this is pretty, pretty much a think piece about that, so we don't have to go into it. All right, mm-hmm. next up. So apparently, Gina Carano of uh, which Fast and Furious was it? Was it Fast Six? I think it was. Uh, Fast. Was it Fast and Six? Yeah, it was Six. Oh, probably. It was, I was regardless. Yeah, she was in Fast Six. six so yeah. coming off of getting harpooned, out of, uh, yeah, getting harpooned out of a. a um, a moving plane that was going down a runway that was five miles long. That someone um, survived and yet somebody else didn't, however. Right, exactly. That. Exactly, exactly. So, um, Gina Carano plays, and this is spoiler alert, spoiler, spoiler, spoiler alert for <laughs> The Mandalorian Episode 4. Mm-hmm. Um, Gina Carano plays, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. Uh, you know, that's me substituting for Ring of the Bell. Um, <laughs> okay. The Mandalor, uh, she uh, plays a ex Rebel Alliance member who shows up in the show, and um, this article that we link to explains how, excuse me, <coughs> the Star Wars television series gave her a new sense of belonging in an industry where she was long felt, where she has felt long, like an outsider. Mm. That's good. I'm glad. Yeah, like. Actually, it was just weird. This, I don't know if it, this kind of parallels, um, like I want to say Hemsworth, who said if it wasn't for like uh, Thor Ragnarok, he was like he was felt like he was kind of done with acting or something like that, something around that part. So, um, and it kind of just renewed him. Um, and this is kind of a similar thing for her. Which man, she if you haven't seen that episode, she cold cocks the Mandalorian <laughs> real good in helmet at all. It was like, it all. like in- I feel like. Beskar helmet and all. Exactly. Like she just went and that whole scene, which was going to lead up to another uh, thing we're about to talk about in a second, uh, or at least one of them anyway. Um, that was it was a pretty good, a good part of that episode. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, um, and actually, more spoiler <laughs> alerts, spoiler alerts, spoiler alerts for anyone who has not watched The Mandalorian. Well, first of all, if you, if you haven't seen if you haven't seen The Mandalorian, we, we're, it's established at this point, we're just, and we're still not going to go fully into it. But if you've been on the social media and you have not seen the memes from this, please let us know because I am. How did you do it? Really? Yes. How on earth did you do that? Because that's an amazing feat. <laughs> that is a quite amazing feat. Um, anyway, the Mandalorian star on ruthless being ruthlessly, which that seemed hyperbolically outshined by Baby Yoda. Uh, I'm cool with it. I guess that's, that's what the LBY for all you fellow binge mode heads out there. The LBY, yes, or as some, as some would call Yodito. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, so yes, baby, baby Yoda has been the thing again. That's from episode one of the Mandalorian. Again, if you haven't seen it at this point, I, I, I really want to. I would like to see your ways. How did you? Yeah, do we're we're a month into it now, so it's a yeah, little exactly. hard for us to constantly harp on it. But I do know people that haven't watched it. Who That's true. Watch it. So, but but I've also seen people that haven't watched it but have seen these memes. Right. So, uh, so let's see. Uh, Pedro Pascal. Oh yeah, even though I'm not with Carlos, I've been watching and loving with Pedro Pascal. Um, he basically Pedro Pascal has finally answered the much anticipated question of how he feels about being outshined by his, or according to his ruthlessly outshined by his little green co-star. Pascal took to the Twitter and let us all know this. I'm cool with it. I mean, yeah, he's still getting his. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not the you know the coolest thing about, about this, just on, on a slight side note, you know how there there have been superhero movies where you know the folks in masks have to take off their mask every you know now and then because they have to get FaceTime. Right. So far, we have yet to, and the mat and his helmet has come off. We still haven't seen his face, but it, people people seem to want to go that like that diminishes his acting because they don't show in his face, which makes no sense whatsoever. Right. I had to explain that one to my sister, but. Um... You know, it what's what's weird about this, having come off of a relatively recent rewatch of Rebels mm -hmm. and you know, in the midst of a rewatch of The Mandalorian. I, yeah, I mean uh, of a Clone Wars. Yeah, we we're talking about that pre-show, uh, how he's he's doing the Clone Wars rewatch. I'm just gonna wait till like before the next season comes out next week next year to do my Clone War Clone Wars one, but I'm doing Rebels now. Right. So right. I mean, just just honestly trying to figure out what this whole deal with the helmet is for right. the mandalorian it's kind of you know like where is that from so but there's this whole clickbait session and i think i've had this in the past last couple of weeks is also so there's 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 lore behind it basically okay yeah uh in fact i feel like we talked about an article um the last time we we were there but definitely if not in the clickbait this week then definitely the last week there's it's if there's a lower purpose i believe it yeah, that the Mandalorian kind of hints at, uh, but yeah, it doesn't necessarily go into. But there's sure. definitely lower purposes for it. Sure. So um, next up, uh, there is a, a a newly popular meme coming out of Episode Four of mm -hmm. Mandalorian involving the LBY. Actually, there was two, but this was the one that's that the most recent. Well, right. actually, yeah, this is the first one actually, the one I had, the, uh, alluded to. Right, but I'm referring to the one that comes out of um, one particular scene, and apparently Variety caught up with the director, Bryce Dallas Howard, um, following in her father's footsteps, directing something Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they about, right, like, all right. Yeah, they, they talked about creating that memorable sequence with the LBY and introducing a feisty new female character. Mm-hmm. So okay, so you know Bryce Bryce uh, Dallas Howard, who, who is the daughter of Ron Howard, obviously, and it, it would led me to James like, of course, there has to be a Howard behind some Star Wars related content because, as we know, uh, Ron Howard came in and cleaned up uh, on Rogue One, um, and I believe Brother Clint has been on some Star Wars, but I'm not sure if that's that's, that's true. But I know he's been on some Star Wars in the past, regardless. So yeah, daughter of, of Ron Howard, aka Opie, for some of us of a certain vintage. Um, did a pretty great director uh, debut and got a, some traction out of that with one, this this particular meme and another one that's to follow. Uh, the, 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 the Yodito, aka Baby Yoda with the cup uh, which happens to take off at, on, in social media but only to be subverted by the one that came later on in the episode. Yeah, uh, But this is basically her thoughts on that. Right. Oh, just, that a quick, right. Yeah, just a quick note. I know that Roddy Cat knows this, but Ron Howard actually did solo a Star yeah, Wars. You're right. I'm sorry. That's right. And but you know what's funny about that? The only thing I want to add is it's better than you remember it. I've actually watched it a couple of times on Netflix, and you know what? I I've grown to appreciate the movie. Right. I was one of those ones who didn't think it was bad in the first place. Like, yeah, there's a couple of parts, especially when with dealing with how he got his name was a right. little grown and distant, but the movie in its whole uh, as a whole wasn't as bad as people said it was. Yeah, exactly. I definitely appreciate it now. Yeah. So yeah, so thank you for that correction because I totally that's that you are totally right about it. it was solo and not uh Rogue One. So thank it's you. All good. So you got next. Uh Data Ready. 
uh, weighs in on Baby Yoda craze and Dark Ray. Okay, guess what, folks? We got an, uh, it's December. We got another um, Star Wars movie coming out in short weeks. Yeah, it's coming out very soon. So she basically was on Jimmy Fallon um, talking, basically, you know how she felt about the Baby Yoda craze and in relation to the crow pork craze. Um, uh, which, if I remember this correctly, without looking at this article, she was basically like, "It's Baby Yoda over porks because um, the porks was on set one day, and that was all people could talk about." And she was on set every day. I think she did, she does mention that in, in the in the clip. Um, that was one part of it. But hey, you know, it's Baby Yoda. Come on. Mm-hmm. To which, on that front, I, I will go as far as to say, it's like we're still not entirely sure. There are still speculations on. The creation of Baby Yoda, which we still have not got yet. Maybe that's going to bear itself out in the course of Mandalorian. We don't know. I'm personally still thinking it's a clone, but we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. Regardless, yeah, but yeah, Daisy Ridley um, is pro Baby Yoda. Right. And I get that because the porgs were kind of, eh. Right. So our next piece is this an opinion piece, the next one? I believe it is, yes. Okay, so there's an opinion piece that we have linked to that kind of explores fandoms, Mary Sue, hypocrisy, how, um, you know, some, especially with regards to Star Wars. But it has uh, some weight. Right, and I'm, sh- and I'm, and I, and I definitely find myself in agreement. Having not even read the piece, I definitely understand um, how uh, certain, uh, certain um, portions of Star Wars fandom can be very hypocritical with regards to their. Uh, feelings on um, the Mary Sue-ness of certain things, especially exactly. dealing with um, Ray. Mandalorian's mm-hmm. LBY. Right. So the TLDR is basically like, yeah, they, they, you know, apparently the whole thing was like, if you don't know, it's Ray is a Mary Sue because she somehow got to the force, learned force real quick, despite Luke being a far, farmer and coming across a, a force user in five minutes and knowing how to do stuff. And in relation to Baby Yoda, who's like 50 years old, they can justify that, but they're still, you know, they still have a problem with Ray, which that all goes into a whole nother thing, which again, the whole Mary Sue thing. Um, I'm looking at this article that says Star Wars, what really happened to the Mandalorian? That might be something, the Mandalorian, you may want to check that one out. I haven't seen, that one's a new one on me. Mm-hmm. So, and I see Sabine, shout out to Sabine. My rebels will watch. So anyway, next up, uh, to keep this train of going, Rose Tico returns in the Rise of Skywalker character poster. So yeah. Um, this came out like before actually it was a while ago, actually. Um not a while ago, but this is um yeah, this came out on wait, it did definitely came out the week of um the week of Thanksgiving. I didn't know that much. So uh, but yeah, they have character posters for various characters of uh, the new Star Wars movie, one being Rose Tico. And there, if you're watching the video, can see said picture. And I think there's the others that came out, but I don't know if that, I don't think they linked them in this article. So, okay. Next. So, as of what, last week or, or early this week, the Rise of Skywalker yeah. has been, it was last week? Mm hmm. So as of last week, the the rise of Skywalker has been completed, reshoots and scoring and all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, including some some celebrity cameos. Right. So some celebrity cameos were revealed. Um, apparently, uh, 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 Alexander Hamilton, aka mm-hmm. actor Lin Manuel Miranda, and Grammy winner Ed Sheeran were both spotted in the special look at the upcoming movie that was released. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, apparently, Miranda appears to be a member of the Resistance and will probably have. Uh, and uh, Sheeran was spotted in a stormtrooper costume. Right, which they've you know not outside the realm of possibility. There's been some notable celebrities, you know, uh, just cameoing. I believe Daniel Craig. Uh, yeah, exactly. Was, was a stormtrooper who will have an article about that uh, in a little bit, but. Uh, so yeah, so that's not a big, big, big surprise. Now, even some lesser known people to most people that are known to some other people that just happen to have a, some cameos um, in all the books, I mean, in older, in like specifically Force Awakening or whatever. So right. cool. Um, Star Wars: The Rise of Skywalker, the bizarre inspiration behind uh, Zori Bliss, who is uh, I want to call her Felicity, which that is her character, but Carrie Russell's character. In Star Wars uh, Rise of uh, Skywalker, that's still a weird name. 
Okay. At this point, I don't know. That's that's. I guess anyway. So this article kind of goes into, as what I just said. Um, sounds like this is something from J.J. Abrams' youth, uh, having to do with a motorbike and a helmet. So, you know, it is what it is on that kind of stuff. I mean, he put the Beastie Boys in every movie. Some reference to the Beastie Boys in all of his movies, so right. including Star Trek. So why I'm not surprised. And and Star Trek. It's gonna be Star Wars and Trek. So yeah, not surprised. Next. Uh, so two days after the rise of Skywalker, director J.J. Abrams revealed that one of the actor's scripts ended <laughs> up on eBay. The culprit stepped up, and John Boyega admitted it. it admitted it was his copy during uh, this past. Or last Wednesday's or this past Wednesday's Good Morning America interview. He Mm -hmm. said it was a scary moment, but seems to be able to joke about it now. He is never getting a Marvel movie ever after that one. Uh, Or because the snipers will be out so fast. I don't know. Given the the other people who have spoiled the stuff, as you know, not as much. No, exactly. I was about to say, I think there's definitely levels. Right. like and plus they move, and plus they've used that stuff for marketing in a way, as we found out. So well, they totally yelled at they totally yelled at they did totally yell at Ruffalo for having his phone on like right. live streaming. Right. So the snipers would be out for sure if a script ever made it to eBay. Oh, for sure, for sure. But yeah, and that script it was snatched up by Disney before you know before anybody else could get to it. So I and I joked about this like a day or two of before this recording uh, about this because I was thinking I was like, okay, I imagine that whole scene with the cleaner, who I'm pretty sure probably doesn't have a job. Well, he's moving the apartment, so probably not even a. I assume he wasn't going to have the same cleaner anyway. Um, but if he did, probably not anymore. Mm-hmm. And I imagine it to be the scene, like speaking of Rogue One, out of the the end of Rogue One, where they were trying to hand off the, the plans. Yeah, like I kind of felt like it was kind of one of those things. I thought it was, but that in my mind, that's how it went down. <laughs> it was going from his apartment, changed the hands, and he was chasing it down. But it's so yeah. But on that note, um, Mark Hamill tweets. You know, Mark Hamill being Mark Hamill, Pete's pure response to leaked Star, Star Wars scripts. Um, so yeah, this was, um, I didn't see this at first, but I remember seeing this thing that came off of it or that was before it. So Mark Hamill, uh, photoshopped himself, um, uh, and a picture, picture of the orange bandit who, for better or for worse, is the head of this country, sadly, um, photoshopped both of the heads on, on various other movie pictures, bodies, and with the caption of it's fun to pretend. Uh, hashtag fake Photoshop fantasies to which uh, John Boyega, Boyega uh, responded. And I remember seeing his response, uh, but I didn't see what came after it. Which he basically said, "Mark in with the eyeballs," which means what well, you know, what you know what it means. So Hamble, which part of me was like, this was you know a lot heavy handed, but he basically was like, "Son, I only posted this to distract from the story of someone who moved apartments after leaving a Star Wars script under the bed. It was later than blah 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 blah. I DM you when they find the bonehead who would do such a thing. Oh no, you know, jokingly because you know as we found out, Boyega was the one. So you know, how am I having a little fun of with, course. Uh, with with him like that? So I guess I didn't see this part until later. That was that was pretty funny. I'm like, damn, you, you have no chill, Hamill. <laughs> yeah, seriously, but oh. it was all fun." Right. So next up, but apparently, according to this, uh, some there were some serious phone calls going back to the Borg. There was definitely some serious phone calls from Disney officials about it, which makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, next. Yeah. Next up, um, uh, series creator Alex Kurtzman um, has teased that the Star Trek Picard sh- uh, series is going to have a very different style Borg story. So the depiction is going to be very unique and you can't be very unique. It's just different. It's just unique, but you can be very different. So um, who's nitpicking now? <laughs> I was about to say, you're right, you're right about it. I'm joking with you. I was about to say, shout out to uh, CJ Craig on the West Wing for, for, for reminding me of that one. Nice. But um, that's an early, early callback to anyone who's a West Wing fan. But, right. um, uh, you know, ultimately this is um, – just a, a, another tease for the Picard uh, series. When does that start? Uh, next year, I want to say January, February, it's sometime. I don't know if it's, yeah, it's not definitely that far. Oh, January twenty third. Yeah, I knew it was close. Um, speaking of the the comic book, 
I think it's a prequel to no, it's not a prequel, can't be. But the uh, Star Trek Picard number one just came out this week, uh, that is set in that universe. And I think it's it's not a prequel, definitely, uh, because it's already at a seemed like it's actually from a point, which seems like a little early for that book to be out, given that the show is not out yet. Because I thumbed through it, and I was like, maybe I should hold off on this for a minute. But at the same time, it could very well be still a prequel in a sense, just not a prequel to, you know, the right. start of the show. So, um, I don't know how, how to take another look at it again. Either way, um, Michelle Yeoh wanted to do Section 31 before Star Trek Discovery even aired. So, shout out to me, Michelle Yeoh, um, just in general. But um, apparently in the flurry of Star Trek news over the past few months, the upcoming Section 31 spinoff starring Michelle Yeoh, which we knew kind of sort of about that that was either being hinted at, you know, and whatever, um, has somewhat been sh- lost in the shuffle. In a recent interview, uh, some of the Trek people talked about talked a bit about how things have been going on that front and shed some light on the show's development. So apparently uh, Van- Vanity Fair had an interview with, um, with uh, some folks. On show, namely Alex Kurtzman, the the lead the lead guy on that one. So and um, yeah, so basically he had some thoughts about it, and they talked about um, uh, Michelle Yeoh's enthusiasm for the project, uh, and uh, section one, you know, her feelings about it in general, basically about section one thirty one stuff. Which you know what, the section thirty one stuff, uh, going back to Deep Space Nine, I do I love that part about it, but because it was so different and basically quote unquote not Trek like, right. Um, so it was a part of uh, DS9. That that was part of the stuff that you know most people like about DS9, you know, especially coming up in, through the war part of it. Right. I was about to say it was definitely an interesting subplot. Hmm. So to, but the, I don't know. I guess the problem I had with it was like, well, then you started seeing it just like the Borg. You start seeing it in like Enterprise and stuff like that. It was like, well, okay, Section Thirty One sure probably had its roots back, going back further. And this was like, and d- Discovery is like. A l- probably well, well was originally set ten years, like after Enterprise or something or other like that. So, and I still haven't really seen it, but I know the a lot of it kind of came through there. Which, if you watch the first episode of the Discovery, you can see that plain, without even you know, if you know Section Thirty One and knew, you know saw the even the first episode of the Discovery, you can you definitely saw the shades are already coming out on that one. So okay. where, wherever it went, you know, during the course of the the, the seasons. Because we'll find, I'll find out, but most people know at this point. Alrighty. Um, sadly, our next story is uh, um, from uh, Star Trek.com, which reported that it was deeply saddened that um, Dorothy Catherine DC Fontana mm-hmm. had passed. She was the legendary writer who brought many of Star Trek's greatest episodes to life. She passed away peacefully at age 80 on December 2nd following a short illness. As a writer, Fontana is credited with many episodes focusing on Vulcan culture and helped blaze a trail for female writers in sci-fi television. Yeah, DC Fontana is a name that uh, I'm sure a lot of people in definitely the Trek Lord know, but she's also done a whole bunch of other uh, writing in the past on other shows. Um, Babylon 5, Six Million Dollar Man, The Waltons, Bonanza, to name a few. Like Her name has been in a different places but like the most notably for for trek uh, and, and it's uh various inter- iterations so you know condolences to uh her her and family i didn't find this out until the fourth and that's so i saw this article I was like oh damn and uh, how did this get past my timeline mm-hmm. it's weird anyway um there was that um Watchmen on the HBO Prime Show, show I'm still not watching. HBO teases Lady Trio's uh, major connection to a classic character. I'm assuming you may know more about this than... Yeah, I'm up to date. I'm, I've been watching. It's actually been pretty good. I've enjoyed it. But I've I don't know. Her. Right. I'm not, I'm not as... Um, I'm not as uh, adamant that, uh, you know, that they not touch it. You right. know, they not touch the original source material. I actually rather like... Which is weird because some of people have been saying they should have. It should have been more comic book like from what I've seen. What I was going to say is no, but what I appreciate though is that they took it, and this was a prime example on expanding. Mm-hmm. I think they've done an excellent job of expanding upon what had been done before. Okay. So it is, in a sense, uh, a sequel, a true sequel. 
but it's definitely set further way further down the road than i think a traditional sequel would be set sure so um uh do you want to just cover the story real quick um go for it oh uh, I, I was about to say, I didn't even look at it. Oh, well, basically, because I don't, I mean, so Brave Friends is this character, uh, Lady Trio, right, is, you know, who's a part of the story. Like I said, you would know that part of it. For, but since she debated, uh, debuted a few weeks ago, the Vietnamese trillionaire has come to Tulsa, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. to build a mammoth structure referring uh, referred to as the Millennial Clock. While her ultimate motivations remain unclear, she's been using her immense wealth, uh, uh, intelligence, and charisma to ensure that everything goes down perfectly. Although she's never had a role in Alan Moore and David Gibson's comic, Gibbons comic, HBO just teased a major potential connection between her and the central character of the comic book, The Comedian. Which okay. again, means would probably mean more to people. Right. Uh, so yeah. actually, that was being the one to ask. So I know, shout out to friend of the show, Matt Wang. Has he? Do we know if he's seen this or not? I haven't asked. I should. Uh, yeah. So when he finally catches up, I know he was out of the house tonight, <clears throat> so he's not watching live. But right. um, when he does catch up on the show, he'll probably reach out and let me know if he's watched it. Yeah, um, I would be curious as to because I know he is definitely a fan of the books and uh, or the book, and you know, uh, if he's seen it, I'm sure he would have some some thoughts on. Uh, on this also right um just related uh, in a related story this is actually an older story but we're just putting it out there now just mm -hmm. a reminder to folks that um writer damon lindelof suggests that his hbo drama watchman may only last this one season so that is actually um that is cause to uh, watch this a little bit more closely and to see how things get tied together because things are getting tied together as we speak. So if you are not yet up to date, you still have time to catch up. Right. I think there was a reason why I pulled this because because I don't think we pulled it when it was originally one originally came out and two. I think there was some. I felt like I've seen some people wondering about that. Well, there's going to be a second season, right? Possibly, yeah. So I don't know. And I mean, who's to say there could very well be? I mean. Just, that's not right, nothing set in stone at this point. Exactly. So we'll see about that. Uh, Umbrella Academy season two has finished filming, according to the stars. So Tom Harper, who plays Luther Hargreaves, space boy on the show, posted a picture to Instagram on November 20th, remarking that season two would wrap production in two days and praising his co-workers. And if you're watching the video, you can see said Instagram post. Um, I have still yet to watch this show. Same. Yeah, so, and um, Justin Mann, who was also on the show, who plays uh, a character on the show, uh, uh, is here photographed with his Funko Pop. Nice. Yeah. So, there. There you go. Nice. Uh, next up, uh, Lock and Key officially has a premiere date on Netflix. Uh, it's uh, February 7th. 2020 which is not far away yeah. um, this is based on the this, this series is based on the idw comic book uh by joe hill gabriel rodriguez jay photos and robbie robbins the mystery series will follow the three lock siblings and their mother as they move into their ancestral home key house following the murder of their father so um that is netflix grabbing up the original content mm-hmm and I guess I wonder if this is the book that was that was responsible for Joe Hill getting his own DC line. I guess possibly. Yeah, who knows? Um, James Bond. Well, you know, Joe Hill obviously didn't want to go by Joe King. So wait, what? What happened? He didn't want to go by Joe King. What? Is that his actual name? Well, but that's Stephen King's kid. I did not know that. I did not know that. Well, hey, the more you know. Uh, James I'm, Bond. I'm mistaken because that's he's that's how you know that's how it was pitched to me. And weirdly really um, enough, that makes that DC makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah, about the DC books, like he you know he wanted to make, yeah, Joseph Hillstrom King. Huh. He, his pen name is Joe Hill. Huh. Again, that makes now that makes way more sense. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. I'm about to say again. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. And knowing is half the battle. Yeah, I, I had that. I should have probably put that one. I should have did that one myself. But yeah, I that, yeah, I really did not know that. So, yeah, yeah interesting. Um, and I get it. Yeah, you know, yeah, your dad's, you know, your dad's your dad. And you want to, you know, 
You want to have your own thing. Well, especially if your dad is Stephen King and you're going to be a writer. So, right. So, you know, if he was a pro baseball player, he wouldn't have cared. Well, yeah, probably. So, huh, that weirdly makes a whole lot of sense in a couple different ways now. Okay. So, James Bond returns to action in the first trailer for No Time to Die. Did you see this? Did yes. It? A lot of fun. Yeah, I liked it. Um, so there was a teaser trailer before that. They had a little bit to uh, some stuff, uh, but I decided not to put that in there because it wasn't unnecessary. That because there basically was a trailer. It was it was a teaser trailer saying, "Hey, it was going to come out this Wednesday," which was a few days, you know, which was like Monday or something like that, or this past Monday, uh, of at the time it was recording. Right. So, then this came out this Wednesday, and I was like, "Man, this movie's coming out." I feel like this movie's coming out a couple of years late. But there's also there was also the the off and on of whether Dan Craig was going to come back for it, and we now know that this is going to be his last one. Right. Um, I still need to go back and watch Spectre because I've not seen it. Um, and of course we get a glimpse of Rami Malek uh, as the bad guy, even though they say he doesn't say anything, but he actually, I think he there is some voiceover before he seen his face. Or, right. Yeah. But regardless, yeah, like I said, I enjoyed the trailer. It's it's definitely a Bond trailer. And um, shout out to Lashana Lynch, who's also in the trailer, whom I hope they don't kill off. Um, you know, and um, Naomi Harris, who sh- probably should have been a double O, but they relegated her to Money Penny. So mm-hmm. I, I was going to say, I don't remember much of Spectre. That wasn't Spectre. That was in. Um... No, no, I'm just saying, um, you know, the, the the most recent movie. Right, I don't remember much of it, so I'm gonna have to try to catch up and see if um, I have in fact watched it. I think I did, but right, I can't remember right. exactly. Yeah, it's been a couple of years. Like I had, weirdly enough, I had a copy, but I think I threw it away by mistake for some stupid reason. Yeah, I mean, it's listed as a 2015 film. I'm like, wow, that's a while ago. Mm-hmm. We've done a lot of comic book chronicles since then. <laughs> right, and yeah, and like I said, they've since then they've been going back and forth on whether one there was going to be another James Bond movie period much less daniel craig coming back for it so that's been kind of the juggling for since then for a couple of years so it's a thing uh ghostbusters afterlife is the official title of the new ghostbusters movie which, no kidding it's a so the weird thing about that is i saw a, a, a tweet a tweet which may have something to do with this um but this is coming out on well this came out a couple of days ago on the third and I saw this tweet before that basically saying that, you know, Ghostbusters two makes a whole lot of sense. Somebody, somebody said Ghostbusters two makes a whole lot of sense. If everybody's dead to which I don't know if I could go I, from what I remember of Ghostbusters two. I'm like, I don't know if that would have mattered to any, but at the same time, I guess, but yeah. So Ghostbusters afterlife, that's what we got. And this movie is still coming next year. Okay, yeah, with the uh, with the most of the OG cast, right? So uh, anyone who's going to see uh, Jumanji: The Next Level is going to get the Ghostbusters three trailer uh, next week, right? Wow. Okay. <laughs> next up, um, like that's a real medical solid, solid two zone of the interest thing, but only a few people who would know understand what that means. Mm-hmm. So uh, the move, the GI Joe spinoff movie Snake Eyes, um, has cast an actor to portray Snake Eyes' father, Stephen Alaric, um, who is recently on the Amazon Prime original series The Expanse, has been cast as Snake Eyes' father. So, what does this dude look like? Uh, I know, man. Hey, I will say The Expanse is a great show from what I've seen of it. Granted, I've only seen the first uh, first season. Um, so I don't know who do this person is playing on it, but if he's on that show, it's probably all right. I don't know. I, that's a broad speculation on my part. Um, but okay. So he's kind of brown. Mm. Let's to the Googles. He is uh, born. In Toronto, Canada, to Jamaican parents, one of Chinese descent, the other mixed black, white, and Indian. Right. So, yeah. But being that Snake Eyes is being played by Henry Golden. Right. Who's of mixed descent. So, exactly. So, it kind of makes some sense. <coughs> so, yeah. I mean, I can see that. Sure. All right. Okay. I don't, I still don't recognize this dude, but whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, Expanse is good, y'all. Next up, uh, Vin Diesel. I believe we are. 
Uh, yeah, we are at the end of the, the cinematic news with this, in that uh, Vin Diesel teases more Fast and Furious, Riddick, Triple uh, X, and group projects in the future. And two prob- two of those are probably in the same universe, if you go by my thinking. Right. Maybe even three. I don't know. I haven't pulled uh, into, the, to, into it yet, but we'll see. So basically... Um, but you know what I was going to say? Basically. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, and Mr. Diesel says that after the longest filming shoot of my career with Fast 9, uh, a film I am so immensely proud of, um, that scares me. I was about to say, dude, if you said the same thing about 8, I got problems with you. I still haven't seen 8. Um, Diesel shared on his Instagram post, before entering the next chapter, excuse me, the next character in film project, uh, so much to be excited about. Fast continuation, Xander Cage, uh, Riddick, Groot, not to mention the possibility of Witch Hunter. Oh, wow, another Witch Hunter movie? Huh. I don't know if that I, 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 that, that first one was actually not bad. It was better than you'd think it would be. I will say that. Um, but apparently he's he's doing another one, another guess, and the follow-up to Bloodshot, which I guess is coming out fairly soon, I don't know. Uh, before all the press that con- coincides with the release of various pr- pictures next year, I must take a minute to center. And so he's basically saying he's taking a break before he, he gets into the rest of that stuff. Uh, so, hey, guess what, folks? Buckle up. <laughs> we knew the Fast and Furious stuff was coming. I didn't know too much about uh, after, and still haven't seen that last Fast and Furious, uh, a Triple X movie, now that I think about it. Uh, didn't know any if any Riddick or, you know, whatever was coming. That Witch Hunter movie, though, that's, that's the surprise that he's doing that. But uh, hey, it makes sense, I guess. Have you seen that one? What's that? The Witch Hunter? Yeah. No, I have not. Okay. Yeah, it's like again, it's it's yeah, it's, it's not terrible, but right. it's not it is what it is. Anyway, we will go vastly and fastly into comic book news. Yep. <laughs> Starting off with the best comic books of the decade, according to entertainment. Okay. Um, some stuff, you know, some notable stuff. Some not surprising stuff from Saga to Batman EU. Ow, I'm excuse me, EW. That's EU, which is a different thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> picks the 15 best comic books of the decade, which feels kind of um soon, given that granted, yes, we're in December, but still. And this list came out in November, so again, the, the you know, the stuff you would ex- expect to be on that saga's on there, uh, Batman's on there. Uh, Miss Marvel's on there. Right. Nice. Um, FF. FF is on there. Wow. Gonna... The Hickman. Yeah. Oh, no, this is not the Hickman FF. This is Fragment. Fraction. Fraction. All red. Wow. Yeah. And also, speaking of Fraction, Hawkeye, which, yes. Yes. That, that was a great ass book. Uh, oh, and... Hawks Pox. Wow. Yeah. That's see, that one. Hmm. I feel like that's a more of a Game Awards type stuff. Like, that thing just happened. Come on. But at the same time, I'm not saying it's not worth it, but at the same time, it's also... Mr. Miracle Works, Monstrous, which I have not read, but, you know... I know somebody who's read, who's been reading Monstrous and, and enjoying it a lot. It's show... It, it, listen, it's it's soldiers on. I have to give uh, Marjorie Lou yeah. credit. Sana, it's a kid, a ton of credit. Mm-hmm. They soldier on with this book. There are always a ton of people in front of their tables at uh at new york comic-con they sold out all of their books like within the first two days of the con yeah i was say, probably for a couple of different reasons the book happened to be the big part but also marjorie lou um yeah. but like they had no i think they had like the the like they had sold out of like all the the newest trades i think nice on their table like within the first two days you know they were there thursday friday saturday sunday i think by the end of friday or even early Saturday, all those books were gone. They were just doing signings after that. So that right. was right. Cool. Now I think about, I know two people who who's been reading Monstrous, uh, and and they've enjoyed it. And they're not big comic book readers, so that is cool. I definitely got my number one sign though. Nice. Shout out to me. <laughs> nice. Oh wow, the Gillen, um Young Avengers book. Wow. I props to that one. That was a pretty decent, but hmm, I didn't think too many people. Yeah, interesting. But yeah, there the, the list is out there. You can check it out. And there's some stuff that you know that are lesser known stuff. But you know, there's a couple on there that we we know and appreciate. Mm-hmm. Well, so, I know that people like the uh, what's called that Nemo book. Yeah, and Lumberjanes. Right. 
has a has a little cult following. So, but yeah, that F, that fraction FF that was totally unexpected. Yeah, I mean, but I, I mean, granted, fraction, but still, right? I mean, I own it. You know, mm -hmm. I own most of it. I don't know if I own all of it, but I definitely own most of it. Right. Black Hammer also on that list. So I'm sure there's some fans of that, but yeah. Know. Again, the least of the surprise is probably Batman. Yeah, but, because they've had two big runs on it with Snyder and with King. So exactly. So there is that. But yeah, there you go. There is that list. Um, next up. All right. Next up, uh, Patch, aka Wolverine, and Chris Anka join Black Cat for two upcoming issues. So this is straight out of the solicitations. Nicked, bub. Yeah. Oh shit. And, and Anka's doing um. Anka's doing um. Wolverine. So yep. that'll be good. Sounds good. Um, here we see a cover from which that looks like Gwen Stacy. Um, yeah, it's like an alternate. That's a variant cover, right? So I'm just like, wait a minute, because they're promoing the new Gwen Stacy uh, uh series. Oh, right, I forgot about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but you yeah. know, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna get the Campbell cover anyway. So I know. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, wait, I think. Oh no, that's Gomez. That's it. Says right here, uh, Carlos Gomez. So yeah. So there you go. It's, uh, story starts in Black Cake number nine. Jet McKay still writing it, and it's still out in February again. Like uh, Agent Seven said, solicitations, which by the way are out for. Um, Marvel and a couple other people um, in the last couple of weeks. So, yeah, some of this will probably be coming out of that. Roxanne Gay, Method Man, uh, Kyle Baker, and more lead new Marvel's Voices title. So, sounds like this is a comic book that is coming off of coming out of a podcast. Uh, following last year's debut, yeah, of Marvel's bi weekly podcast interview series, Marvel's Voices. Marvel will continue to expand the spotlight on some of the comic book industry's most critically acclaimed storytellers with Marvel's Voices number one, written and drawn by an all-star roster of talent, including Vita Ayala, um, uh, not Ava, <laughs> right. Ryan Gay, Brian Stelfies, Freeze, Method Man, and many more. Yeah, there's a whole host. So I've mm. actually got the, a physical copy of the February 2020 previews that I'm holding up. Okay for everyone who can who's watching the video and i just flipped to that oh, wait, yeah, let me let me let me oh, all right so here we go so um for uh those of you who are watching the video this is a copy a physical copy of uh the february 2020 solicitations it's uh, the marvel solicitations the uh um, wolverine is on the cover and you know flipping inside this is the marvel's voices um uh, add uh, a solicitation for the book. So mm -hmm. it's going to be a one shot that's going to have lots and lots of creators um, uh, uh, contributing new stories with lots of different characters. And these are um, the authors and the, and the creators are generally um, female or people of color. Yes. Oh, and speaking of a couple of names, which I, I think I forgot to pull a story. Uh... Uh, uh, for the lineup, but um, if you've been watching the Twitters and follow um, David F. Wolfger, Sanford Green, or Chuck Brown, you will know that Bitterroot is coming back in February. Yes, uh, and because they've been they've been talking about yeah, they basically got their stuff down and it's, and it's, it's, it'll be out there. So look forward to that if you are a fan of it, like I am. Uh, I'm I'm excited to uh, to see that coming back. Uh, so there is that, and that's because I forgot to, to pull that for some reason, or I don't think I've seen an article on it now that I think about it. Uh, next up, uh, let's see. So you did the voices, Marvel's first Braille comic inspired by football player with blindness. So this is off of the Hero Pro Marvel's Hero Project uh, documentary on uh, Disney Plus, mm -hmm. and um, the latest a real life subject. Um, known as the Unstoppable Adonis, is going beyond his community and changing the face of football and even of Marvel Comics itself. Adonis, a high school running back, has completely lost his vision. And uh, despite losing his sight at age five, he stuck with his dream of becoming a professional football player, defying all expectations and creating new inroads for athletes with disabilities on his high school team along the way. And cool. if you're watching the video, the you can right. see the cover. And I was going to say, and I guess the comic is lettered with Braille. Cool. Oh, that's dope. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, there's a, also a clip uh, from the from the Marvel Hero Project thing. I still have not watched that one yet either. I um, haven't either. Yeah. God forbid I not, you know, do a, a rewatch of uh, Clone Wars, right? 
<laughs> I mean, that's kind of mandatory at this point, you know. Yeah, know. Um, so, yeah, so yeah, it says to bring, uh, apparently you can read, uh, to bring Adonis' story to life in comic book form, which you can read for free through marvel.com. Uh, project manager and editor for Marvel, Marvel's Hero Project, Catherine Brown, a symbol of the team of comic book veterans, including uh, writer Mike Rach, I uh, hope that's his name, pencil Kevin Sharp, inker Lorenzo Ruggiero, uh, colorist Lee Duggig, Duggig, that are Joe Sapino, and Todd Knock as the cover artist, as you saw from the, the cover that I just put up. So, cool. All um, right. We'll check that out. Wait, it is actually, let me look through this real quick and see, because it's uh, yeah, it is actually out there now, so you can go check that out for free on Marvel.com. Cool. Yeah. Next. <gasps> it's you. Uh, Don of X's Fallen Angel skips February 2020, but has plans to continue, quote-unquote. Which, why do I feel like we talked about this before? I think we did, just in conversation. Uh, I feel like the last time we talked... Uh, no, okay. It may have been one mm-hmm. of those previews where uh, we saw the solicitations are early. You know, maybe, but basically, um, Brian Edward Hill, who uh, indicated on Twitter that he'd be taking a break from the first arc, noting that he's already had plans to return because basically he has film and TV projects because he is one. Well, one, he's part of the writers' writing team on uh, Titans, so I'm sure there's that's one of them, and uh, as is uh, one of the other things he's probably doing. So he says, uh, due to film, TV things I have in motion, that's my main career, and I have to grow it. I had to take a break from the first arc, but there's already plans to continue the story in a very cool way, but I can't comment on that yet. Uh, he'll explain the tweet. Now, I think this article says that it doesn't mean that he's going to be the one to do it, or at least it doesn't state whether he's going to be the one that's doing it or not, but that it, there are plans to continue in some way, shape, or form. Um, so, yeah. The last solicited issue is uh, number six, which is next year. And news around, I'm gonna get an editor because you need to, you got a, you got a typo here. Yep. Oh wait, you do have an editor. You might want to actually let me stop. Let me stop. Um, that'd be something. It's like, what if I got a job with one of these people? <laughs> it's harsh, man. It's harsh. I'm sorry, but yeah. and I know I have plenty of typos of my own. But look, I, yeah. harsh. All right. Next up. Next. Um, Spider-Verse, the title, just introduced an Aunt May who's absolutely terrifying. I have not and been reading this book. I have I I I I stopped reading after the first one, and I oh. know the second one just came out. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, as, as Spider-Verse books are wont to do, you know, we're going around the different um uh parts of the multiverse and different people who have gained spider powers. This particular iteration of Spider and Spider-Man's Aunt May became her world's version spoiler alert spoiler alert of carnage now that's frightening oh so this is not wait so this is okay okay i was thinking it was that same one that was from spider-verse um but apparently yeah this is a different different one. that's pretty terrifying yeah i <laughs> mean it's carnage oh, huh. weird. yeah hey it could be worse could be golden oldie right or it could be better actually i was about to say yeah that's anyway the- yeah, basically. Um, so if you don't know that reference, look it up, folks. Uh, Spider Man is about to become Marvel's. Actually, wait a minute. Did I? I should have. There was a. There should have been another article around it, but no, whatever. Uh, Spider Man is about to become Marvel's Sorcerer, Sorcerer Supreme. And apparently, speaking of symbiotes, uh, in December, Marvel Comics launches Symbiote Spider Man Alien Reality. A uh, miniseries set during Peter Parker's time bonded to the alien symbiote before it became Venom. Uh, however, as the creative team takes things to the past, the web slinger may be may get a previously unseen magical status quo. So, a magical retcon, if you will. Um, so, yes, this is coming out of the February's 2020 solicits, and sounds like it's quite possible that um, Spidey becomes Sorcerer Supreme. I mean, he's already been Captain of the Universe, so why not? Sure. Uh, and this is Peter David and uh, some panelist favorite, Greg Land. Oh! I knew as soon as it was one of those, uh, what's one called? Those retro, you know, the, the, the retro style books. I was like, mm-hmm. oh, man. So, yes, Greg, Greg Land being a favorite of uh, half of the. Um, 
Oh my god. Hey, quote unquote favorite of half of the uh panel. <laughs> Here, but just in general. Um <laughs> so yeah, and if you're watching the video, you can see the cover for uh that's looks like that's issue three of uh that awful, awful stuff. <laughs> Anyway, move right along. All right, next up. All uh, right. Uh, we talked about this earlier. Dr. Doom right. just disrespected the devil on his own turf. This yeah, he duffed him. He duffed him badly. Right. Dr. Doom number three, right? That's correct. Okay. So, yeah. If you haven't, if you're inclined, you should, you should, you should read it. Just in, it's, it's, it's a pretty interesting issue up until it gets to the end. But even then, it's funny. Um, an all new Ultraman, excuse me, all new Ultraman stories. Uh, to arrive in 2020 from Marvel. So apparently uh, Marvel and Subaraya uh, Productions, <clears throat> excuse me, are excited to announce a collaboration that will bring new Ultraman stories to comics and graphic novels. Ultraman! Um, unveiled at Tokyo Comic Con, this new collaboration will launch in 2020. Now the question is, is this coming over to the States or is this just something over in Japan? No, it's coming to the states. My Apparently, uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, which makes sense because that um, that um, you know, there are Ultraman fans here, and that that Netflix series is a thing. But this looks like it's more you know, in line with classic Ultraman. Sure, I would be the right. I would be the jerk. Be like, whoa, that's Jet Jaguar, and you know what people <laughs> would say to that? You know what people would say to that? You know what they would say to that? Hmm? Well, there's that too. <laughs> so yeah, so there's been, if you did not know, there's been many, there's been as many versions of Ultraman as there has been uh, Super Sentai, aka Power Rangers. Right. Um. So yeah, that is a thing. Go look that up. That's funny. One of well, no, well, actually, that had nothing to do with Ultraman. Well, it's, I was going to go back to the um the the Japanese Spider Man thing, but that's not that's not that. That's more of a mech thing. Anyway, move right along. All right. Uh, Marvel promotes Steve Wacker to head of content new media. So he's been uh, promoted to uh, – uh, he's the executive producer on the Disney Plus shows Marvel 616 and Marvel's Hero Project and is a producer on all of Marvel's television animated series. He's yeah, the he's editor right. of Marvel Comics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, shout out to uh, Wacker. I don't know. I've seen him, when, seen him a good bit on um, on Twitter in the last past, past few years. He's – an amusing cat i've never seen him up until this picture but right and what i was going to say is he actually had i heard him on podcast before he actually had a pretty uh uh good role in the creation of ms marvel too so right that's right because he was the editor on uh right. at the, uh, when when yeah uh kasana was the son of Amanat was the assistant i think correct. was correct so yeah and that's another reason why we love him uh by proxy Mm -hmm. Marvel's Avengers devs always expected a struggle, quote unquote, to win favor uh, over to its fresh faced heroes, says Games Creative Director. So, yeah, this has been a thing. People that didn't like. Um, so, Crystal Dynamic is a video game developers doing that. Marvel's Avengers uh, game that's coming out next year. People, you know, even since E3 doesn't don't like the faces or the costume. Or the costumes, but I don't have a problem with it because it's you know knowing where they were going with this whole thing, especially coming from Spider Man, which had a similar thing going on. Who on the Captain America? I don't. Okay, I guess. But you know, it, 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 they potentially they particularly have not gone a comic actor right that they, they intended not to, especially with the comic uh, the Marvel Games Group mm -hmm. involvement in the, the game because they wanted to basically do like side original stories type stuff so, so which means the face is not going to look comic accurate people have a problem with that okay sure okay but regardless this is the you know this is basically you know i'm saying they recognize that i guess all right uh speaking of video games this is one of the mobile games marvel's champions marvel champions recently released core set offers more uh several heroes for fans to take down the villains of the marvel universe right including uh whole, so they're putting out uh a new thor hero pack actually so they basically have different packs for different heroes so it's like um iron man black panther hulk shield that, 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 so now they're introducing uh i think uh, spider-man was also a pack in in the beginning um i can't remember what came with the base stuff but also now uh, they're coming out with this Thor hero pack and whatever stuff that comes with it. I still haven't had my hands on that game, but 
Uh, there are, I can link to folks that are taking broad looks at or taking deep dives into that thing. I also saw something I meant to, to uh, on a side note that uh, that miniatures game that we talked about a couple of weeks back that I know you almost had an interest in. I almost sent you some stuff about. Right. But uh, but I didn't. So it's, I all, know. it's okay. That's an expensive game to get into. Yeah, that is also true. So there is that. Um, there, boys. Um, oh, there was also the there was something about the uh, the other mobile game, Realm of Champions. That, so there's a site up for that um, that you can go check out. Right. Uh, there's there's it basically it doesn't have much on it except for like some of the houses, quote unquote, and some stuff from the Watcher. But you know it's out there if you want to check it out. Um, unboxing and review Transformers Refractor Reconnaissance Team Three Pack. I kind of want this. So basically, this is Shaq News' uh, unboxing of the uh, Refractor Three Pack, which is the camera. If you're an old school Transformers fan, that's the three three um, three robots that turn into a camera. I've always wanted this one. I never had it. Really? Uh, yes. I have n- actually. I take it back. I feel Where like I have purple. Hands on it. Huh? Uh, I believe it was. Okay. The, if not in the animated, then the original version was. I, I, I in one of those versions, it definitely was. And oh, if you're watching the video, this is not. Gotcha. So basically, it's seventy bucks, and I don't know if it's out yet. But they basically, um, it from what this article says, they liked it. So I may end up getting this at some point. <laughs> Knowing me. I didn't get it when I was a kid. I can get it now. Well, I can hope to get it now. So we'll see. All right. Uh, next up, um, James Tinian the Fourth has shared some new details on his plans for the Batman series once he takes it over in January. And job number one for the Dark Knight is to fix Gotham City. So in an installment, in the first installment of the writer's newsletter, the Empire of the Tiny Onion, because all the writers have newsletters now. Um, yeah, that's true. He shared his first big idea document he wrote after DC officially hired him to write Batman. So uh, the gist of it is that uh, Gotham City is not quite foobar, but close. And uh, Batman has to kind of work his way back and he's going to fix things. So he's going to make it so that nobody like Bane can ever do that to Gotham again. I don't know. I. I feel like maybe, maybe probably was Tim. I should ask him if he's been looking into some of these newsletters. I feel like he said something about it before, and I don't know if I should be. I'm reading a couple. I have. Oh, a yeah. couple. I have. Um, I have Brew Bakers and Pox. Greg Pox. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, so that's always been a curious because yeah, like I said, we've seen these comic creators like they, they've they've been doing this like they've oh, been, yeah. that's been the thing that's been going on for a minute now. I have Jason Aaron, Greg, uh, uh, Greg Pock, and um, and uh, uh, Ed Brubaker. And mm-hmm. I, if I go into my email, some of them don't come out that regularly, but I definitely see um, Greg Pock's come out on a regular basis and um, Brubaker's. Hmm. I think, doesn't Sazaki have one, or he's like threatened to have one, or it's a joke one or something? I, I feel like I've seen that out there. But regardless, hey, that's the thing. That's, yeah, that's it is a thing. thing. Um, speaking of James Tinian, um, Tinian's Batman run starts early in surprise, um, number 85 bonus edition. So apparently as a bonus, Batman number 85 will also feature a prelude to their darkness, their dark designs, the new epic written by James Tinian the fourth mm-hmm. that gets underway in Batman 86 and touches on a revelation of Superman's secret identity, which we've already talked about in the past. That's going to be a thing. Um, read DC's description. The two-page sneak peek guest stars the Joker, features art from Guillaume March, and sets the stage for what's coming in 2020. Okay. So. Um, spe- I have more Batman news. DC's informed retailers that Sean Murphy's Batman Curse of the White Knight number five is coming out a week early, originally solicited hey. for December 18. It's actually coming out next week to December hey. 11th. Yay. I love that series. I like the first volume. Of, I uh, have been kind of enjoying this one in yeah, a way that I've been, been, been enjoying Batman yeah. at all. You have been a big booster for the series, for the yeah. White Knight stuff in general. Yeah, specifically the first volume. This one, this one's still pretty good, but it's you know it's yeah, you know, it, yeah. But yeah, I, I'm I'm enjoying it, so I don't know. Go go read those books. 
Uh, TNT celebrates Bat Week with animated Jim Lee artwork. Uh, and that was from, I guess that's, this is maybe past due, but this Thanksgiving, we're thankful for Bat Week, but we're especially thankful for this amazing DC Batman custom Jim Lee illustration, according to the TNT's uh, dramas uh, um, Twitter account. So to celebrate the to Cape Crusader, TNT will be airing, or probably have aired at this point, um, uh, Batman-centric movies all week long. The fun already started with this past Monday with Batman for Batman v Superman, Batman 89, uh, Batman Begins Returns, and Lego Batman, which I still have not seen, Dark Knight, Wonder Woman? And Batman... Okay, yeah, he had a bit part in that, but that's not necessarily his movie, but uh, all right, sure. Okay. But yeah, so that was this past week, So, which means... Actually, it's still... No, it's gone. Sorry, that was the, the week of uh, Thanksgiving. So it's gone now. You missed it if you hadn't seen it. Sorry. It's all, right. all right. Uh Step on Sedgwick's Harleen number three has been postponed three weeks, according to a notice sent by DC to retailers. So three weeks, not so bad, not doomsday clock. <laughs> Indeed. And he's got a couple of other things in the fire anyway. So because I believe he's still doing art on and I don't know if this is the reason why, but I know he's doing art on Aquaman and he's got his own stuff that he's doing. So I don't think there's any reason. I don't think this gives any reason as to why. So, but yeah, Joker, Holly Quinn, uh, Criminal Sanity number two, pushed back two months. Ooh. Uh, yeah. So the issue number two has been pushed back to January 1st, uh, 2020 release. This is the second schedule change for the issue since it was originally solicited back in September. DC changed it from solicited November 6th date to December 4th. Uh, issue number three has been solicited for February 5th, 2020. And that is an update from a, from a previous story. So Okay. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Bat Week, um, that was uh, on TNT. Tom King responded to TNT's official Twitter account um, and wanted to hear, uh, no, in response to a tweet that wanted to hear what controversial opinions people have about Batman, King said that uh, Denny O'Neill, Neil Adams, Steve Englehart, Marshall Rogers, and Frank Miller should be um, added to the list of Batman's creators beyond uh, Bob Kane and Bill Finger because those writers helped really define how we see the Batman character today. Mm. That is a, a, a discussion for another time. I'm not sure. I, I feel like I agree to a point. But at the same time, like at some point, that's got to end. Right. It's got to stop somewhere. But like, I, I, I don't disagree with his thinking to a point. But I, and this has come up before, so I don't know. I really don't. I don't know. But maybe some other time we'll revisit that. Um, Year of the Villain, Hell Arisen, first look teases a major DC death. Uh, so yeah. That's a thing. By the way, uh, New Year's Evil, that's a thing that ca happened this week, uh, that came out this week. I have not read it, and I I assume it has something to do with that Year of the Villain stuff. I don't know. But regardless, this is the first look of this Year of the Villain, Hell Arisen thing, whatever it is. Uh, and yes, Batman, whose last is involved with it. Sure. Next. So, speaking of Doomsday Clock. I'm so glad you got this one. <laughs> So, in a teaser of what happens in Doomsday Clock number 12, we're finally getting a face-off between Clark Kent, a.k.a. Superman, and Dr. Manhattan. So, it's finally happening. We'll see if it comes out. I'm going to owe somebody a dollar, or someone's going to owe me somebody a dollar. So, we'll Is see. Actually, wait, was that bet actually made? Accept it. If I'll, I'll pay off on it if it comes out in December. Okay. I'll send. I will. I will. I will gladly send PCN underscore dirt a dollar. So it is worth noting. I said this on Twitter. So so agent uh, agent seventy knows this already. Uh, as of November twenty second, this past November twenty second, it has been two years since two whole years Jeez. since the Doomsday Clock started. My gosh. So that was that's pretty funny in itself. Uh, DC promotes Jessica Chin to editor. So congrats to her. She was in his. Long-time DC Comics employee, I believe she was a, a, also a, an assistant editor. Yes, for the last three years, she's been an assistant editor in the Superman editorial group under 
Brian Cunningham. She's been she was the lead editor on Supergirl and Metal Man and assisted on Superman Action, Lois Lane, a book I love, and Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, which is also a pretty good book. Shout out to Matt Fraction. Uh, and she says in a tweet, uh, or she had said in a tweet, Bat's out of the bag. Uh, I've been promoted to editor at DC Comics and excited to edit even more of the best books and characters in the biz. Cool. Can I have a job? Um, next up. Uh, DC's He-Man and the Masters of the Multiverse comic has changed up the lore of Eternia drastically. And it's having its own sort of crisis on infinite earths. Um, so it, this is a book I talked about a couple of weeks ago, but right. this, this was a part of it that I didn't, I neglected to mention when we talked about it. Right. So apparently there is a version of, oh, you can talk about it because this is kind of long. Um, so basically the TLDR is basically the, they, and I think I've kind of sort of mentioned this, but there is a version of, of Eternia where uh, Skeletor's, uh, human, more humanish looking form, I guess, not the skeletal form, right. is not does not become Skeletor, but seemingly on his potential way to be He Man, the way they're to, to, to be going about it. Um, to where, yeah, so basically, because he gets to see in the future and well, he gets to he gets visited by the, the movie version, and they were like, hey, in almost every other version, you become Skeletor, uh, but in this version. You know, he's still his blue self, and he may or may not have a relationship with Beast Man, who is known as Red Beast. I guess who was originally known as Red Beast, which I did not know, but uh, that's kind of hinted at. And there's also hinted at um, uh, Evil Lynn got some cakes. That's, I will say that if you, you know. Okay. And apparently, another thing I did not know was her name was Evelyn Powers. I that never knew that. Know. Yeah. So, yeah, and she shows up, Sans. Um, I was about to say sans clothes, but you know, sans headdress, definitely. And you know, is the front. It's actually a fairly decent read. I, I need to go back and actually finish it. But uh, no, actually, I did finish. It. I'll take it back. But it was actually not a bad read. I don't know where it's going to go, but we'll see. Next. All right, uh, I'll take over this one since you sure. read the the majority of that or dealt with that. The Crow is back for a killer <laughs> Christmas special. So IDW is publishing a new one shot, uh, The Crow Hark the Herald. So. Yeah, that's kind of weird, but okay. I know, right? Who's thinking about the crow at this point? Uh, there's the um, there's the cover if you're interested. But I mean, this got a cult following, so who am I to say? I right. think they're trying to get a movie off the ground. I don't know. Um, acclaimed comic writer Howard Cruz dies at 75. This was from November 26th. Um, he was 75 years old. He is the creator of Stuck Rubber Baby and Wendell. I, I know I remember seeing some common creators on Twitter talking about him. I am not familiar with his work, unfortunately. Um, his daughter made the announcement on Facebook. Says, well, with sadness, I share that my birth father passed this afternoon after a too short battle with cancer with his dear friend Pam and loving husband Eddie by his side, uh, amongst other friends, she wrote. Okay. And uh, you can you can see uh, the pictures from the Facebook stuff. So, condolences to his family. Next. All right. So we're on our spillover page, right? Yes, we are. Not All much right. enough. All right. Let's see here. Daniel Kibblesmith takes the terrible adult Calvin strips to the extreme. Okay. I did not know that was a thing. So, um, yeah. Apparently, Daniel Kibblesmith, who wrote uh, the the um, the, the quickly deceased Loki book recently, mm -hmm. um, who is also, I believe, was a writer on Comedy Central or something, yeah. or something like that. I can't remember, but um, he, he took to Twitter and paneled out, uh, obviously without um, without art. He paneled out um, a a strip for an adult camera. It was kind of dark too. So it's, he says here, I know the internet loves those melancholy Calvin and Hobbes fan comics where he's an adult. So I thought I'd take a crack at one. And like I said, it's kind of dark. Uh, and someone went and um, did some art for it to the best of their ability. Cause obviously, you know, you can only do so much without knowing what, you know, what the writer actually wants. So, but they tried, they tried it and it's out there. I won't go into it, but it's kind of dark. Next. All right. Uh, do you want me to take this one? 
Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, IDW, publishes, IDW Publishing launches Spanish language graphic novel program. Uh, George Takai's New York Times bestseller, They Called Us Enemy, Sonic the Hedgehog, DM, and creator owned Red Panda and Moon Bear lead an IDW initiative for Spanish language books. And uh, this came out during a presentation at uh, the National Council, Council of Teachers of English. Uh, keynote that happened i guess recently okay so cool next all right next up uh the creative teams have been revealed for the upcoming anniversary issue of wonder woman issue number 750 series writer steve orlando and artist jesus marino's lead story will tie into the year of the villain current crossover and there's going to be stories by greg rucka and nicola scott Gail Simone and Colleen Duran, Marguerite Bennett and Laura Braga, Scott Snyder and Brian Hitch, Mariko Tamaki and Elena Casagrande, Kami Garcia and Phil Hester, Shannon Hale, Dean Hale, Riley Rosmo and Vita Ayala and Amonke Nahuelpan. Uh, there's also George Perez in there with, uh, I think, Colleen Duran. Right. So a bevy of names, some known, most known and, you know, right. Uh, not so here's a uh if you're watching the video you can see the um the cover the loveless cover and that's coming out uh, january 22nd yep so cool beans there was something else that i saw um g world of whistling as a part of that was a wonder woman related that may have just come out and um well, she just finished her run on it i know but i think there was something in like graphic novel form or something that she was a part of yeah uh, um that may be coming off of that. I can't remember, but I, I didn't pull it. Anyway, um, the Dark Multiverse improved uh, DC's most tragic death by making it worse. So this is something from spoilers from Tales of the Dark Side Multiverse Infinite Crisis number one, which none of us are reading. And apparently it has something to do with the death of Blue Beetle and Maxwell Lord. So if you know anything about that, then be able to demand the rest of it. Next. Okay, is Marvel accepting applications for a new Sorcerer Supreme? Marvel Comics released a teaser seemingly tied to Doctor Strange. Um, a crest with the Latin phrase Electi Carent Elezione adorned with the seal of the Vishanti. So this is, and it says applications due March 2020. So that's interesting. So I thought this has something to do with that other thing for, for that Spider-Man become the social social thing, but it's apparently it does not. Mm. Because that's something that's a yeah, that's all throwback, whatever. Uh so yeah, we don't know what this is being teased or what series it is, but it may or may not have something to do with uh Doctor Strange's Surgeon Supreme uh book that is starting next month. Right. Or actually excuse me. Starting this month, month, I think. Later this month, yeah. Yes. Uh, meanwhile, Dark Realm Marvel's Realm of Champions mobile game would ascend Stephen Strange to Agent One status. That's true. That was a, that was knew there was another reason why I was bringing that up, but whatever. Uh, so yeah, we'll I guess we'll get more news of that as time goes by. Uh, Sony may promote PlayStation Five with Holiday Spider Man sequel. We kind of talked about this pre uh, pre show. So there's some speculation. Um, uh, that kind of came off the funny, kind of funny podcast. Uh, that there may be a sequel to PS4 Spider Man uh, video game, great game if I haven't said that before. Uh, that may be coming after the launch of the PS5, which we know to be coming next uh, holiday season. Uh, and apparently, one of the the hosts on um, one of the hosts who is a former game informer editor. Uh, who apparently has some inside knowledge of that, which kind of slightly rubs me the wrong way because they basically said, like, yeah, they think that, that the Spider Man's coming at this such and such as inside. Then they had the back off and said, well, I think I know too much. So they put that out there deliberately, but then backed away from it, which, granted, you know, there's only so much you could say if you know so much, but at the same time, like, you kind of knew that going into this. So you just kind of put that on. That's a nitpick with me. Nothing whatever so whether that bears out to be the case because of the the other host on the show was thinking it was coming like later or whatever the case may be but this person seemed to have a little bit more knowledge given context they have um to the alternative so we'll see what happens i mean that'll be good news for well anybody getting a ps5 
Mm-hmm. For sure, if it happens. And if, I don't know, if there's rumors of um, backwards compatibility uh, is the case, then the one that's on the PS4 will probably be on there anyway, by proxy. So we'll see. Anyway, last but not least. Right, so this is mild spoilers for the yes. the, the the Thor, the worthy book that was out this week. Um, I have not read it yet, but I just took a quick scan at this article, and basically there is a panel in which um, Wonder Woman and Superman pretty much appear un... Uh, it's it's unambiguous who these characters are who have wielded yeah. the Yolnir before. It's and pretty unmistakable. Right, and these have happened in uh, Marvel DC crossover, so this is nothing controversial. Which we, a little behind the scenes, we had a little chatter in our background about Amalgam characters, which has nothing to do with this, but I'm kind of wondering if some of that might have... Well, the precursor to the the Amalgam characters, yeah. Right. So, I don't know, because because there's been like some slight rumblings to whether they're true or not, whether they're bringing those Amalgam characters back or not, but I, you know... I mean, at the end of the day, uh, it's this would definitely be something where the EICs would have to have a strong hand in this, much yeah. like, yeah, much like when Joy, Joe Casada had a strong hand in uh, shepherding uh, JLA Avengers through. Mm-hmm. You know, the, you know, if they were ever going to do another amalgam type thing, they would have to have someone that this would be like a CB Sabolsky project. Where, oh sure, yeah. You know, or even a Kevin Feige project where they would have to absolutely push this through and work with the distinguished competition to get that done. Right, yeah. They are both sides of the both sides of the island would have to be on on board with this and come to another come to definitely some agreement on who's doing what and all the all the logistics behind it. So mm-hmm. uh but yes, folks, we are at the end of the show. Finally, uh we have another ad read before we go though. Our last ad read of the night is for Busted Tees. This episode of the Comic Book Chronicles is sponsored by Busted Tees, your home for funny, awesome, cool t-shirts that are sure to get your friends' attention. Busted Tees puts many of their popular shirt designs on sale each week. Choose from several eye-catching t-shirts inspired by many things. These These t-shirts are cleverly themed and inspired by movies, Video games, TV shows, comic books, geek culture, pop culture, and more. They are, they are all on sale. To help keep our podcast free, order from Busted Tees by going to cspn.us. That's cspn.us. Then click on the Keep Our Podcasts free link. Click on the Busted Tees banner and then shop for awesome t-shirts. Busted Tees through cspn.us. Do it today. Did a rewatch. There's a there's a Tron recognizer shirt on or design on here, and I just did a rewatch of um Tron and part of Tron Legacy, and probably will do Uprising, which still doesn't make any sense to me. But I think I'm I get where they're going with that. But once I get through Legacy again, we'll see. Okay, I actually do that because I never watched uh Tron Uprising, which is basically the animated version that may have come after Legacy or came before I, Legacy. I, I was very young, I think, when I watched Tron all the way through, and I don't think I've endeavor to watch it again i love that movie that is one of my favorites i don't care yes i i have yeah i think uh pc and Unscrewed are also a fan of oh, God, he's a huge fan of this um so we does it that is one thing we both shared uh in, in common but no i like legacy that's it's a little harder to get through but not as hard um but oh, Tron, the original trying to love it it's weird because I did the, the rewatch and I was like, "Why? Why does it seem like like?" Granted, they cleaned it up, you know. It, it is it is the 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 latest the newest version that they had, it, but it felt like they added some um some things, or maybe it's it just because I hadn't seen it in a while. That's more likely because it was like, "Wait, why does it look like they special edition this?" Because and also like uh, prior to that, um, watched the special edition. I mean, watched the uh, New Hope as we have talked about before. But, gotcha. But no, nah, they they didn't. It's the same thing. It just looks good, and you know, they didn't seem cool. like they changed anything. But yeah, try. Okay, so before no. I would say before we wrap, uh, since we did our last ad, I just it's not exactly what's in the box, but um, I just wanted to mention that I did um, that that my patience has, has, has you know actually did pay off. Um, for any of uh, our followers who follow me at agent underscore 70 on Instagram, 
um, or even Twitter will, will, would have seen in their feeds this week. My patience paid off despite having scoured several. I don't want to go into double digits because they don't, they don't exist in the local New York City area. Nothing within the there's no Walmart within the five boroughs, but I definitely scoured the the, the Walmarts I felt like driving to, like in with within a reasonable driving distance. And zero, got you. what's that? You should have said something. I would have got you. I well, did, you saw it. You saw it at your local Walmart. Probably. I didn't. I didn't honestly hadn't been in that section in a minute. But I, I, I got you. I got you. Well, I mean, given how fast they hit, they they vacated the shelves. You know, mm-hmm. spending on the local toy collector. Uh, community, they might have been gone already, but uh, next time I'll ask. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it being Walmart, not Walgreens, but Walmart, um, this was a lot harder to get. And I'm talking about the worthy Captain America from uh, from Avengers Endgame. This was released just before the movie came out, and and in wide release just after. You can see, I'm I'm trying to shade the the, the camera a little bit. But you can see that there is a Mjolnir right behind the shield. If you look right, I'm trying to tilt it to the camera. There we go. Mm-hmm. You'll be able to see the Mjolnir tucked in right behind Captain America's shield in the packaging. I didn't want to take it out of the packaging yet. just wanted to show it off that it finally came. I got on Amazon, just a small markup, you know, reasonable for me. So it worked out. Indeed. So oh, you know, just like the shit I teach, patience. Exactly. I was say the only thing I actually got from um, Black Friday outside of the fire stick I told you about was um, the the Blu-ray of uh, Avatar: The Last Airbender. Okay. Twenty bucks for for which is that's a damn good price for that for for like nine discs. Oh wow! Oh, this is a series. Okay. Yeah, okay. All series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, not the awful movie. I gotcha. Oh yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, it's a series. Um, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. 20 bucks, which there's a funny story behind that, but I won't get into it right now. So yeah, that was that was the only other like well, outside of video games was the only other Black Friday or surrounding thing that I ended up getting. All but right. um uh, folks, we are into the end of this here show. Um we would like to the each thank each and every one of you for coming out. Uh for myself, Rodicat, you can find me at Rodicat on the Twitters at that, and you can also find me at News Nurse Need. On um, Twitter, you can also find me at CB Caps on Instagram, uh, Agent underscore seventy Twitter and Instagram. Well, you may have already seen that Captain America he is the, and the restraint that he is. You should applaud him for this restraint that he has showed for not opening it up before now because that was days ago. Yep. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, you can follow us at oh, my, uh, ride a cat for my Instagram, but uh, I don't unless you want to see pictures of booze or some other. Drop mix. I end up posting on there. Just wow, wow, wow. Um, <laughs> PCN underscore dirt on Twitter. Uh, Pop culture net on Twitter. Pop culture network dot com and all those umbrella sites they're in. <laughs> the Osiris of this ish. Tim D O G G nine eight on Twitter. Uh, C B Cron on Twitter, which is the Comfort Chronicles account. Theclicknation.com uh, dot com and the Click Nation on Twitter. There's the uh, that's the T H E K L I Q N A T I O G N because I keep forgetting the um, which I feel like I don't have to spell that, folks. Mm-hmm. And also, comic book resources where he's over there writing his face off. Go check out his work, he, he does some good stuff over there. Get that man some looks and some, you know, clicks exactly. Um, and you can also find his, which I did not say this earlier, but you can find us on the Com- Cold Slither Podcast Network, the CSPN.us. Do it today. Indeed. Uh, you can also find us on Google Play, Apple iTunes, aka Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and the Cold Slither Podcast Network's SoundCloud page. We will be back next. Wait a minute. Yes, we will. We will be back next week because we before Carl couldn't come in until the week after that. Correct. Um, so yeah, we'll be back next Thursday night, uh, nine thirty ish, nine between nine and nine thirty PM, you know, something like that. That's, I feel like that's a running joke that we just pretty much <laughs> ran, just ran all the way out. Um, right, I, would, just, I would just mention that uh, uh, for everyone to maintain. Um, maintain uh uh observation of our social media because um we're not going to exactly run into the holidays correct we're going to be close 
So it all it will all depend on what our schedules are. Yeah, Twitch. We we'll, we we may may have some more news um, next week about that. Whether if we have anything concrete, but yeah, like you said, keep watch on our various social medias, and we'll definitely let you know one way or the other, or probably not at all, and you'll know. Yeah. Uh, so for that, this has been Comic Book Chronicles. Peace and blessings. Peace. One. And I love it when a plan comes together.